Welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday. This is The Hangup right here on the line. I'm Matt Dillany. And what am I hung up on today? Well, since 2013, Missouri has had 154 mass shootings, causing 582 injuries and 156 deaths. And that does not include the mass shooting that just took place in Kansas City, Missouri, at the end of the Chiefs' uh, victory celebration for winning the Super Bowl. Uh, that right now lists one dead and 22 people with gunshot injuries, not counting in individuals who may have been injured um, in the surrounding chaos as people were running. I'm going to read something uh, to you because my friend and a uh, friend of the show, Dr. Daryl Ray, was there. Um, Daryl was at the event, and here's his post after the shooting occurred. Daryl said, thanks, everyone, for your concern. Yes, I'm okay. I was about 100 yards away from where the shooting happened, but I didn't actually see anything except one person who was in uh, medical care. The rally was just over as I was coming down the hill. I could see most everything below me when someone set off some fireworks. That caused a stampede for a moment or so. Then things calmed down, and people continued to exit west on Pershing Road. I was following the crowd and stopped to get a hot dog at a stand when I heard another noise. This time it was not fireworks. People came stampeding back in my direction, yelling, get down, take cover. I stepped behind a big truck. Everyone stayed down and undercover for about 10 minutes. Then we got the all clear and I started walking west again. I soon passed a small medical cart with a man in it who looked in shock. Someone said he'd been shot, but I couldn't tell as I was just walking by. For the next 20 minutes, ambulances and cop cars came past me going south and east as I walked north and west back to my car, which was about two miles from the rally. I'm amazed at how fast the news travels on this. I wasn't even 400 yards or so on the other side of the shooting scene when my phone started blowing up, and we had terrible phone coverage from, with literally a million people using their phones. I didn't know as much as the people contacting me. There were police, helicopters, and a drone right above us. I imagine some of that was news media. That's a post from Dr. Daryl Ray, who was about 100 yards away from the shooting when it occurred. We do know that uh, I think two individuals at last call were in custody. Uh, they don't know anything about a motive, but they've recovered weapons as well. But one person's dead, 22 are injured um, in what Missouri can count as the 155th mass shooting since 2013. Um, They've got them marked in, in years. So 2020, they hit a record with the most of them, and it looks like 21 or 22. Uh, most of the other years average out at about 12 or 13, um, which makes sense, 155 shootings in a decade or so. And, um, hey, this is their fifth one already. It's February 14th. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. We love our guns. That might be the only thing that we actually truly love uh, because we don't really love our freedom. We're not working to protect it. We don't really love democracy. The Supreme Court's not even working to protect that. Um, we, we definitely love our guns. And, you know, uh, I don't understand why this is a problem that is so difficult to solve and people are like oh it's a mental health issue well um certainly there are plenty of individuals with mental health issues all across the nation in many different categories but mental health teams seems to get the blame for anything and everything if the shooter is um, someone who used an alias in the past that matches with a different gender as of what happened the other day uh, the anti-trans crowd will start claiming that they're they're the, that the, the shooter was trans when there's no evidence that this is actually the case. Um, uh, not for this shooting. This is for the other shooting that happened the other day. Um, and, and then they want to blame it on the mental health issues. Mental health issue, mental health issue. And yet, how do we treat people with mental health issues? And I don't mean how do we treat clinically. I, I know that experts, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, uh, facilities that are, that are there to treat proper patients. I'm saying, how do we as society treat people with mental health issues? Because I don't know anybody 
who doesn't have some mental health issue. I mean, I know a lot of people, and there are um, there are people. Virtually everybody I know has some sort of issue. Maybe it's a minor issue. Maybe it's worth counseling. Maybe it's not worth counseling. Maybe it's worth treatment. Or, but we don't really look at people with mental health issues as if they're people who genuinely need help. It is almost as if we point to a mental health issue and say, "Ah, that's the thing to blame." The, we're, we're not going to we're not going to blame the individual, and we're not going to help the individual. We're going to say, ah, if you're trans, that's mental illness. If you're gay, that's mental illness. If you're a left winger, that's mental illness. If you're a right winger, that's mental illness. If you shot a bunch of people, that's mental illness. Okay, fine. Then let's just call it all mental illness and start working on actually fixing it. Because labeling it and throwing it, throwing people in a bucket doesn't seem to have done us any good. We're, we're in the midst of February and in a celebration in a relatively smaller and quieter town. I'm, I am from Kansas City originally. I was born at North Kansas City Hospital. I lived in Gladstone, Liberty. Uh, I am familiar with that area. My parents live out there now. Uh, my brother, who's in chat, hi, buddy, love you, happy Valentine's Day, um, also grew up out there as well. And I've, I, I know what it's like. And it's impossible to to have security at an event like this where you have a million people out in the open air air in wide open spaces celebrating um something everything becomes a target and there are going to be people who have mental issues who are going to take these opportunities to use that as a target they're going to be people without any identifiable mental health issues who for attention for revenge for notoriety whatever the reason is somebody's going to do stuff like this so i guess we should just give up let's not bother trying to let's not bother trying to legislate guns or weapons anymore or let's not work on mental health issues let's just realize that um because of what we've built and because of the way we tend to view the various issues that might contribute to this we're just screwed we're never going to fix it. We don't care enough to fix it. Um, we've said this over and over again. If um, somebody walks into a school and opens fire, um, that pisses off everybody in the country for about a day. But nothing sticks anymore. Nothing keeps us angry enough to make any change. We have we spent four years with the dumbest, most dishonest individual that's ever been president uh, who's under indictment for, I don't know, a gazillion things. I'm just approximating. I'll round up a little bit. Um, who's still the front runner for the next presidential election uh, for the Republican Party, um, who, who has a chance, who, who's been ruled to not be immune, but may end up delaying this case long enough to where he could get into office again and then try to pardon himself uh, and then you have yet another constitutional crisis. Yeah, you know, why do we care? I mean, what are we doing? Right, we're just watching people shoot people, kill people. Oh well, it's just Valentine's Day. It's another Wednesday. Let's move on. What What do you got on the schedule for tomorrow? Yeah, let's, let's ignore it. Hey, you know what? There's a new episode of The Bachelor. You know, we didn't. We, we should just go watch that, take our mind off of it. I'm, I'm being, I'm, I'm frustrated and being sarcastic. And by the way, I'm just as guilty as everybody else. I'm absolutely just as guilty as everybody else on this. And this is not a, you know, a sanctimonious, I know the right way and I would do it better thing. I don't know that I would. I'm just being completely honest. I um, I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to fix the broken world. I don't know how to make truth matter again. I don't know how to make accuracy matter again. Um, I, I, I don't know how to make com people more compassionate. And when I say I'm just as guilty as anybody else, I am. I, it is... This, was, this, this came up last minute and it'll be something to talk about, but 
on Sunday, I'll be back on the on the Sunday show, and Katie Montgomery will be joining me. And Katie hasn't done the Sunday show with me. I haven't got to do an atheist-based show with Katie in quite a while. So I'm looking forward to it, and we're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time. And when I go to Florida here on, on Easter weekend uh, to do a debate at a church in What's Tampa, up, heathens? How y'all doing? What the hell is that? I am so sorry. I tried to get John's channel link in the description, and... <laughs> <laughs> the channel video played blasting through everything. That scared the shit out of me. Well, in any case, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Arden interrupts my flow with an accidental audio thing. It won't matter because none of us are going to give a shit about it later. And by that, I'm serious. We're, we're Right now, the lines are open. And people can call in. And as always, on all of my shows, if you are a theist, if you believe in something uh, supernatural that you want to defend, by all means, call in. We'll talk about it. But I guarantee you, as soon as we start getting calls, we'll, we'll get a call and we'll start talking about other subjects and nothing will happen on this. The United States government isn't going to do anything. The government in Missouri isn't going to do anything. And we know that. And it's one of the reasons why we're all frustrated and why we're all not going to do anything because we feel completely fucking helpless. What could we do? You could try to elect better people, but the Democrats aren't going to do anything more about this than the Republicans have done. Oh, little bits. So, I mean, we'll make little, little, you know, we'll edge closer to something. And, and I'm not going to pretend to know what the right answer is. And so I'm going to do the show. We're going to take calls. John and I are going to visit a bit. Um, we'll hang out and, uh, then we'll take some super chats and we'll talk to people and I'll let you know that, Hey, welcome to the line network, primarily about call in shows, um, where you get to call in and talk to people and not just this show. This is the Wednesday night show with me. Uh, but tomorrow is the transatlantic call in show and Katie and Arden will be hosting that Sunday show is going to be me and Katie. I already mentioned that Monday skep talks going to be Shannon Q with my Atkinson and Wednesday. I'll be back with another episode of the hang up with the magic skeptic, um, who I've never met and I'm looking forward to, to doing it. And I guarantee you, I don't, I, I, oh, I can't guarantee, I bet it's highly unlikely that after my opening monologue is over and we get on to callers we may never mention this particular shooting again and we'll just wait until there's another shooting um that makes headlines enough because we haven't talked about the 155 shootings in missouri over the last 10 years um matter of fact i haven't talked about any of the other four shootings four mass shootings that took place in missouri so far this year because they just didn't make the news maybe that's the solution maybe since some of these people I would think are interested in you know, perhaps um, ending their life via interacting with police, uh, others might be interested in getting on the news. If we just stop reporting on these things, maybe they'll stop happening. If we just ignore them, maybe they'll go away. Um, I don't think that's quite how it works, but I'm at a loss. I don't have any solution. I don't have any prospects for a solution. I just know that I'm sitting in my office trying to get some stuff done before a show tonight when Arden comes in to tell me that there's been a shooting. And as soon as she said where the shooting was, I was like, I need to check to see if Daryl's okay. Cause I already knew that Daryl was at that parade. There are other people who I'm friends and family with who are probably also at that parade, but Daryl's the only one that I knew for sure that was going to be at the parade. Uh, cause we joked about it this morning. He told, he said where he was going to be standing and that he'd be wearing red. And I was like, well, you'll be easy to spot at that thing in red. And then I hear somebody is open fire. Probably two people is what I've heard, which, which really changes the dynamic of it. How do you, how do you have a, you know, you, you definitely don't have a situation where you've got a lone wolf gunman. Um, if you have two people shooting. I got, I got nothing. I got nothing to add, nothing to say. Um, in an hour, we won't really care. In a day, very few people, apart from those who are directly impacted, will spend any time on this. Once the funerals are done, uh, we'll all move on because we're anticipating the next one. 
and the 59,000 other things that are going to go wrong over, over the next year. We're in the middle of an election year. Um, there's a couple people showed up who are saying, what happened? I've been shopping all day or where was the shooting? The shooting was a million people showed up for the Kansas City Chiefs celebration parade. And at the end of it, somebody opened fire. Right now, one person's dead and 22 are injured. So sorry to do this, um, but welcome my guest. Maybe John will have all of the answers that we've all been looking for. Uh, John, how do we keep people from running around killing people? And how do we make people care about the truth and empathy and all that? Got, got anything? I'm giving up. I'm done. <clears throat> I feel like it's easy. Don't vote for conservatives. <laughs> I've, uh, and I mean, Normally, I feel like pre-2016, I would have never said that, but I feel like nowadays, especially with um, how many instances of hypocrisy we have from the Republican Party, um, like, for instance, with, you know, school shootings and especially the shooting in Uvalde, um, you know, we saw, you know, Republicans say, oh, well, it's a mental health issue. And they normally talk about it being a mental health issue. And then it's like, okay, well, if it's a mental health issue, let's do something about it. Let's provide schools with more funding for mental health and all this other stuff. And they're like, nah, we don't think so. And then individual states are now like, you know what we really need in schools? Chaplains. And so now, like, there's a plethora of red states that are passing laws to allow chaplains to have unrestricted access to students in schools. Uh, I know Texas, uh, where you're at, Matt, I believe they've either passed it or they're currently debating it. It's one of the two, I, I don't know where it's at in, in the legislative process there, but I know that the um, different religious leaders in Texas have all like combined and said, this is not a good idea. Don't replace school counselors with chaplains. And like the, the, um, the requirements that they have for these chaplains is just ridiculous because it, you just have to be some kind of chaplain. You could get, you know, you could take 40 hours of some kind of course online and be, you know, designated a chaplain. And then you could have unrestricted access to children as long as you can pass a background check. And that uh, enters in an, another level of problems because like school counselors are required to have like master's degrees and like so many hours of of you know uh d different things that that help them in their job uh that provide the the best care for children the best counseling that children can get and you know all these people have to do is just be be a chaplain and pass a background test which I have a lot of problems with because the proclivity for religious communities to hide pedophiles and sexual abusers is, is rampant. Like it's so bad. Of course there's the Catholic church that has their own problem, but the, the um, Southern Baptist convention, the, uh, I think it's the SBC. I, I can't remember what the acronym is for the Southern Baptist like coalition. I think maybe that's it. Um, Southern Baptist they convention did, is SBC. Okay. Uh, they, you know, they did that study where they identified a whole bunch of Baptist churches that were like hiding and circulating pedophile uh, preachers and pastors and everything. And so my, my problem is, is that in that particular community, it seems like there's a proclivity to hide people that would definitely want to exploit young children, not just spiritually, but also sexually and, and all these other uh, aspects. And so it just seems like all around, there are multiple reasons as to why you would not want this to happen. But for whatever reason, uh, conservatives think that more God in schools is, is what needs to be done. Uh, you know, and I just, I, I don't, I don't get it. That's why I say don't vote for conservatives. While there may be outliers in the conservative or the Republican party of, of reasonable Republicans that actually want to do something. I think that for the most part, uh, unless you can find one of those outliers, um, you're like they're just ruined right now. Like the entire party is. That that's not me saying vote Democrat. Obviously, I'm just saying there's a problem with the Republican Party, and that 
it would probably be best to allow them to sort their shit out before you start actually seriously considering whatever they have to say. Yeah. And, and, and I don't, I don't even disagree in any strong way. It's just, um, okay, cool. However, 50 ish percent of the people living here are absolutely going to vote that way. No matter what you say, or I say, or it doesn't seem to matter how many people die. Uh, and how many days in a row we wake up hearing the news of yet another show? Well, it doesn't matter. And it's, for some reason, we've built a system of propaganda, of marketing, where we are just, so I mentioned, I'm, I'm from Kansas City. I watched the Super Bowl this year. It's the first time I've watched the Super Bowl. I haven't. I didn't watch the Chiefs' last couple of wins. Uh, I haven't cared about football all that much, but you know, I I enjoyed it. We we thought it was a really good game overall. You know, for what little I care about it, but I can't. I I'm, in my head, it doesn't make any sense for me to be a fan of Kansas City Chiefs just because I was born there. Because not like the players were born there, you know, people were recruited from all over the place. There's nothing about it that's like, ooh, it's your hometown. But even if it were, even if it were my hometown and everybody on the team were my hometown teammates, I don't understand why on earth I should be proud of that or why I I should have that be my favorite. Um, and similarly, not only have we have we done this this sort of divisive um my team and all the others becomes an us and them we do the same thing with the political party oh i'm going to vote for the people with the r after the name the people with the d after the name the people with an i after the name the people with the g after their name you know i found my team i found my brand and it doesn't seem to matter what potential policies are going to be in, impacted or anything else it's it, it, it is like there's like a 2%, you know, bubble of people who are, are swayable. And it's because we've made some issues. Well, we didn't make them this way. Some issues are, are, are ultimately the end all be all. And so I, I know a number of people who are absolutely going to be one issue voters on abortion. Um, and, and I know people who are this way on both sides of it. If there are two candidates, and one is wanting to end um, a, a right to choose and the protections for, the, for people who are pregnant, <coughs> and the other one is trying to eliminate that, there's one person who's going to vote for one and one person going to vote for the other based only on that issue without looking at anything else. And then there's a handful of other people who are just going to vote R or D, no matter what's going on. I mean, I think Biden has done okay job an acceptable job the economy is getting better he's got good record on a number of things but he is far from my ideal candidate and now people are like oh I, you know he's got a terrible memory well that's not quite what the report said but in any case i i, I watched um uh, uh john stewart come back to the daily show on monday where he dug into you know the the trump biden election and what we're going to see in this year and everything else and he was brutally honest and we all should be they're both old as fuck, but I got problems remembering stuff on occasion as well. So you got Biden, who's 80 something, going to forget things, going to have a stutter, going to be made fun of. And yet, in spite of all that, things are operating generally better under him than under Trump from my perspective. But there are people who are going to be abortion only. There are people who are going to be um, gun rights only. There are people who are going to be, you know, pick, pick your issue. Where are the people whose who's one issue is let's end mass shootings and demanding that somebody make that their platform? I know they're out there. I just don't think they have enough influence or gravitas to, to overcome the other issues. It, we got, we're, there's so many people who... There are more people pissed off that Taylor Swift appeared for a few seconds during a football game and, and willing to do more to prevent that than there are people who are willing to do something to prevent mass shootings. There's plenty of people who are going to be upset about it. Most people feel frustrated because they're not in a position to do anything. And I, while I agree with John, hey, you know, you got to watch who you vote for. Um, 
I don't, I don't see a path to change. Well, and I mean, as far as change in that respect, no, I mean, I think that simply, you know, the, the, the people that would be listening to us, I, I don't like, obviously yeah. I, I don't think they should vote Republican, but I feel like the amount of people that would have to not vote Republican would have to be overwhelming, like more so than is really feasibly possible. So I don't think that that's like a solution, like an, like an, um, I guess a practical solution for it, but I feel like that's the only solution that would actually accomplish anything because the problem that i find with republicans in the Repo republican party is that they think that they are trying to end gun violence because like i feel like the, the general republican out there definitely wants gun violence to end like they want people to stop but the problem is is the single issue thing that you were talking about like there's people out there that s singly vote on abortion, like <clears throat> limiting abortion or uh, access to abortion. Like that's all they care about. That's the one that's their pet uh, thing for uh, 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 voting for somebody. And I think that the, the whole single issue thing is really kind of what undercuts a lot of um, progress that, that we could make because, you know, uh, I, I, I said in a video of mine last week that, that I feel like Republicans often vote against their own interests and like a, a Republican could run on a platform where he's like, I'm going to pass legislation where I'm allowed to punch you in the face relentlessly every single day if I choose to. And it's like, but I'm also going to ban abortion. And like Republicans will be like, huh, this is a pit. This is a weird situation here. I'm going to have to vote for you because you're going to ban abortion and I will take the several hits to the face every single day to ban abortion. And I feel like that is not too far off from how Republicans actually vote because, you know, re Republicans in poor areas like in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama, they still vote for Republicans, even though they have the worst track record for supporting uh, the middle and lower class class and but yeah. they still vote for them because of these single issues and i think that until we get past that there's just there's not really going to be a lot of hope i mean just think, uh, like ted cruz he would rather turn a school into a death trap than do something about mm -hmm. gun violence in schools yep. or in america in general and i feel like that is is like a, a, a pretty big indication as to where at least you know, like half or uh, more or less than half of the country is at right now because that's who they're going to vote for. Somebody, maybe not Ted Cruz, but like somebody like Ted Cruz out there that, that you know, says dumb things like that. But on the other hand, he wants to ban abortion. Yeah, I think all of us are voting against our own self-interest on a number of occasions. And many times voting against your self-interest is good and laudable. Um, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of my self-interest to help bolster some individuals who have been you know on on the worst side of things for ages um but there's a difference between voting against your self-interest because you're trying to correct things and help things counter you know a privileged position or, or work more towards equality because you know then there is voting against your own best interest in order to help corporations and billionaires get richer uh because everybody because the american dream has lied to everybody so that they think um when they see somebody has become a billionaire they could do that too and you know what you fucking can't the odds that any of you are going to be a self-made billionaire are vanishingly small you are not taylor swift you are you are not somebody you know you, you're not Trump or anybody who inherited a bunch of money and then lost it and re maintained, you know, your money. This is, we, we tell everybody, oh, when you grow up, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. You can't. I'm sorry. As much as I want to, I don't want to discourage people. I want to give them the motivation that, that you, we can't tell the difference between the person who is going to be the, you know, the greatest quarterback of all time and the person who's never going to be uh, even a good high school level player. So we encourage people to try so that the cream rises to the top and we want to give everybody every motivation. But you know what? Very few people get to be president. Very few people 
even get elected to Congress. And we've elected Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, so on that front, all we're doing is boosting people's perspective that they can be anything they want. You want to run for Congress? Go for it. You might win. After all, these idiots won. We, this is welcome to the, the dumbing down. When I saw the movie Idiocracy, I just, I did not like it. It was like, that's ridiculous. And, and every year we get closer to it being a, a documentary. Um, Tesla Ranger pointed out that scum rises to the top too. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And what I will say is something that I coincidentally said to Arden, we're going to move to calls here in just a second, but something I coincidentally said to Arden that I heard when I was a kid and it's just stuck with me. And I think it's relevant, particularly today, to this shooting and how in a couple hours you're not going to hear anything else about it from me or probably John or anybody else. And that's because when all is said and done, a whole lot more has been said than done. And that's the way we are on this issue and so many others. And I get it. You, you feel helpless. You, you, you try to vote for the right people. You're doing what you can. Um, I guess let it sit. And maybe just every time you get the opportunity to ask an elected official, elected official, or anyone running for office a question, one of them can be, what change specifically will you active uh, uh, will you push for to end mass shootings if they don't have something at least asking them the question so that they have to prepare a sound bite for it will get them to perhaps think about it but if nobody ever asked them they get to run for office, get elected, go do their job without ever facing the issue. There's a lot of issues that we should care about. We should, we, there's uh, a war in Ukraine. There's slaughter in Gaza. Um, there's issues all over the place, climate change, everything else. If we can have soundbite questions that force people to answer the issues, we should also make sure that we have one for mass shootings and don't let them get away with a, a non-answer or a half-ass answer. But on that note, we have calls ready. So we're actually going to start with uh, John in California wants to talk about chaplains as a form of replacement for social workers. And uh, so John, pronouns are he, him. Welcome. You're on with John and Matt. Hey, guys. Um, how's it going? And Good. Good. So, yeah, I was in the military, um, and uh, while I was in the military, I, that's actually where I became an atheist. I was I was still a Christian when I first joined, and when this story happens. Um, so, when I was a, a young airman, um, I started my first job. I was working at the Network Control Center. It's a job. Wait, where you were in the Air Force? The network of the base. I sure was. Oh, that doesn't count. I don't even know why we're letting you talk. <laughs> well, you know what? Well, I don't think the Navy counts. We, uh, there you go. How does feel to have the second best Air Force so, in the world? That's fair. Please continue. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, I started having symptoms that I had never had before. Um, I started feeling jittery. I started feeling like I couldn't focus. I started feeling like a scatterbrained where I would, I would open up my email and I would look at it and I would, I would tell myself, I know I need to answer this email. I know I need to start working. But then a few seconds later, I was daydreaming or thinking about other things or I had to stand up and move because I had all this energy and I didn't understand what was happening. Um, and I went to my um, sergeant and I, I, I tried to tell him, hey, there's something wrong. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, at first, he was like, you know, you just need to sit down and work. And I was like, uh, uh, okay. And the problem persisted. Um, I told him again. And what happened was they, they recommended me several options, but I was told explicitly the best option is to go see the chaplain because they are um, 
hundred percent confidentiality, non-reporters. Uh, the only available option like that in the service. If you go to almost any other um, any other resource, and there's actually something wrong that could disqualify you from your job, which I had a top secret security clearance. It's actually, you know, uh, a real consideration. So the chaplain is where I went. And keep in mind at this time, still a believer. So I think I'm going to go get a resource that's going to help me. And I go see the chaplain and I describe to him the symptoms. Um, and his response was first, you got to pray. You got to ask God for help. And I was like, uh, I've, I've been doing that. Um, that's, you know, something I've been doing. It's not like, uh, uh, it's not like I've, you know, eschewed my responsibilities to my faith. I'm, I'm praying. Uh, what else do you have? And then he, he basically said, ah, oh, well, then you just gotta, you know, soldier through. You gotta, you gotta sit down and make yourself do it. And I trusted him and I was like, well, He's the chaplain. Um, he's given me advice. I'm going to try and do that. Well, the symptoms persisted and it got worse. And at this point, I'm like, it's time to go see a doctor. Um, so I actually went and saw a mental health uh, professional and a doctor. And it was the doctor who actually did wind up helping me because I was jittery there um, in the hospital. And he was like, what did you, uh, what did you eat today? I was like, oh, you know, like just bagel and cream cheese. He's like, well, what did you drink? How many cups of coffee have you had? And I was like, uh, I didn't drink any coffee. I did have a couple monsters. And I had no idea. I had no idea that caffeine could have that effect on me because I'd never had disposable income before. I'd never had the ability to drink caffeine at that quantity before. So I was basically overdosing on caffeine and had no way, uh, no, no realization that that was happening. And going to see the chaplain actually not just delayed me from getting help, but it, it could have been fatal. I could have overdosed on caffeine because he was just soldier on through, buckle down, you know, like you can do this. And it was just completely not, not helpful at all. And the idea that people would advocate for chaplains being in schools is terrifying to me. Yeah. I mean, I think even when I was a believer, I would have gone to the doctor long before you did. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's wild, you know, that, that's something potentially that easy to, to diagnose and or treat, um, got sidelined, uh, because somebody thought it was more important for you to see a chaplain than a doctor. Not just that institutionally incentivized. Yeah. One of the, the yeah. issues that I've had, um, with the chaplaincy just overall is I think that the chaplaincy definitely should exist in the military. And trust me, that's not an easy thing for me to say, uh, because we have voluntary service, but we have the potential for a draft. And as long as we have, um, individuals who are going to be forced to serve, I think we owe them um, access to a chaplaincy related to their particular religious beliefs. That said, what the Navy and, and, and what the military has done is engaged the chaplaincy in lieu of having actual therapeutic experts, sci scientific experts. And because of that, you know, when you go to see the chaplain and he's like, oh, you just need to pray. You just need to buckle up. You're just kind of stuck with whatever they end up saying. Uh, and you have to do twice as much work to, to, to be able to, to have any hope of, of getting treatment, which is exactly what you went through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I, I was just going to say uh, in uh, just a little interesting anecdote. The co-creator of Keurig actually had to go to the emergency room because he drank too much coffee in a single day. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to actually get that figured out. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, that my mind thinks of weird things whenever stuff like that comes up. So, um, with the whole chaplains in, in schools, um, they're not really looking to help kids. Uh, because then, uh, there was this question, uh, this like little question and answer session, I guess, uh, in, I believe it was in one of the state Texas houses, uh, of government, um, where the guy, uh, or a guy was questioning the author of the bill that was going to allow chaplains in schools. And, um, one of the biggest things th that I took away from that is that they didn't care about whether or not the chaplain had a uh, reasonable education for helping children. Um, the, uh, main organization that's helping write all of these bills that are going around all these red states. Uh, they're an organization. I can't remember the name right now, but they're an organization that is dedicated to making sure that chaplains can infiltrate the school system and push God into schools. That's, that's their main drive. Uh, at least in the, um, clip that I saw directly from uh, uh, the, the Texas State House thing where somebody was questioning him. They had done the legwork uh, on, on who was funding all of these things. And um, they even suggested like getting this, or, or these chaplains being able to use this app that would, um, all, that would help the chaplains pray with suicidal students. And oh the God. guy who authored the bill, yeah, the guy who authored the bill in Texas he actually said that that like the the fact that um these chaplains were guided by an iphone app to pray with students about their suicidal thoughts he said that didn't matter at all to the legislation being passed and um i feel like that that is the biggest indication of all this like they don't actually care about helping kids They're, they don't care about um, you know, providing kids with the best health care. The only thing that they actually care about, it seems, as far as like the legislation goes and everything like that, that I've seen at least, is they care about getting God into schools and they care about shoving God, specifically a Judeo Christian God, um, into, you know, the throats of children, like just putting it in their face and, and everything like that. So, yeah, the, if you're going into this thinking that they actually want to do something to help, um, I, I feel like you're going to be really disappointed and let down because they, um, they don't actually want to help. They just want to spread their faith. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Republicans don't want to help. Anybody who thinks they do is deluding themselves. But I did want to say a comment on what you were saying about um, the, the chaplains using an app. Um, one of the things that actually helped me get out of Christianity was the presumed expertise of anybody who is pro uh, belief in God and the infinite selective skepticism for someone who's not. Um, just the idea. So I, I like to talk to people and I want to inquire and I wanted to, to actually know what my faith was. And in digging and trying to find out, I started to realize I knew more about the faith than the people who were advising me on it. Um, there was a point where I called a hotline and I, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling with my faith and I'm, I'm having, you know, difficulty in, in these, these questions or whatever they were. And they started bringing up like, uh, like Kent Hoven and, and, and comfort and, and these, these people who I had researched and had come to the conclusion that they didn't have, sufficient evidence, and not only did they not have sufficient evidence, they used very easily debunkable arguments. And I was like, you don't know what you're talking about either. And I just started having that experience over and over again. And now these are the people who, in many cases, are attached to organizations that have a history of covering up crimes about children. These are the people that you want to put in schools. It's insanity. Mm-hmm. I feel the exact same way. I mean, I, I live in, in Alabama and I'm sure that it's just a matter of time before they pass a law here to allow chaplains in schools. And, um, I, I can't tell you how, how angry I would be if some dude, you know, that, uh, may or may not have gotten his, uh, chaplain, I don't want to call it a degree certificate 
from some kind of 40 hour online seminar that he could take and then be able to just print off this certification and have him talk to my son about anxiety or uh, suicidal thoughts or anything like that. Because all they're going to do is be like, well, you just need to pray to God or they're going to look at some app and the app's going to tell them how to pray with this child, regardless of their faith. Uh, how to how to stop these suicidal thoughts and it's like that's not a real answer yeah hey um can i ask sort of an off-topic question to uh to matt sure so i i saw on a previous podcast i'm not sure what day it was where you said you you talk to richard dawkins like he is uh, at least an acquaintance if not a friend um no. my, my, if that's no no, oh, we okay. we did a few we did a few events together. I've had dinner with the man. I've done events on stage with him, but I don't talk to him. Okay. Well, then my question would be: um, I've seen a lot of his recent anti-trans stuff, and it's so disappointing. And I was wondering yeah. if you had the chance to to talk to him about it, and what your insight would be about what he thinks on that, and and. And maybe what you t what you told him about it, and what the conversation was like. We haven't talked about it. I've talked about him uh, on this show, um, but he didn't start the anti-trans stuff until after we were done doing events together. Yeah, uh, I mean, just disappointing, I guess. But uh, hey, uh, thank you guys very much. I gotta I gotta hit the road. Sure. Thanks, John. Thanks See you lot. later. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I am not, I, I would not, I'm not say I don't have his number. I, we don't talk outside of this. We're not friendly. We were f friendly acquaintances who did some events together. And then of course I called him out for his transphobic remarks. And I don't think it's likely that Richard's going to do any more events with me. And I don't think I'm going to be getting any award. I'm not going to get the Richard Dawkins award, which is now such a tarnished monumental shit stain after giving it to, you know, uh, Bill Maher with his anti-science, anti-vax bullshit um, to, to get the Dawkins atheist of the year, whatever. Um, I, if they called to tell me I won it, I wouldn't accept it. I don't, I don't need that yeah. drag on my reputation. I, I, I gotta agree with you there, Matt. Like every time, like, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen like a YouTube video or some apologist that just randomly brings up Dawkins as if he's relevant at all anymore and uh it just it i it makes me cringe so hard whenever i hear his name now because it you know well you know prior to his his, his take on the whole anti uh, his his anti-trans take like i was i was you know i didn't think one thing or, or another about it but every time i hear his name now or somebody reference him i'm just like oh fuck why yep. <laughs> i just right. i don't want to hear about him for people who aren't as in the movement uh, on a regular basis as, as you and I have been over the years, it's like, oh, what when they think of atheism, oh, it's, you know, Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens and, uh, oh, you know, there's this. It, it's fine. You can appreciate everything that all of those guys have done um, for the atheist movement of, at large and still point out where any of them have uh offered up some really bad takes and that's the nice thing is that one one thing about about atheism about secular humanism is it is th there's no top-down authority there's no pope of atheism there's no um here's the closest you get is something like the council for secular humanism or the humanist manifesto or things like that where some where they're basically saying here's what we stand for and then you can either uh, identify yourself as a humanist or not but it's i i yeah i i'm i'm one of the people who has called out um and will call out uh atheists as quickly as i would call out theists i it's just I, I it irritates me when people make my job harder i do enough as it is but so we get, keep going here. We've got from Australia, Matthew, pronouns they, them, uh, wants to advocate for religion as superior ethics. Wh which religion, Matthew? 
um, Christianity. Okay, it says here that religion is superior because it's had thousands of years to develop its ethics, but um, if Christianity is is the true system, then there aren't thousands of years of um, developing its ethics. There's what God says, and that's unchanging, right? No. So God, um, God, what God says been, changes. Been, no, that's no, that's no. Um, there's been okay. uh, you know thousands of years of study. Um, of studying what? Hundreds of thousands of ethics philosophers. Yeah, yeah, but that's not Christianity. Christian text. That's, that's not Christianity. What I'm saying is, what, what, okay, the, so you're saying a bunch of, a, a bunch of uh, ethics philosophers have studied the Christian texts, and that's what develops Christian ethics? No, you, you didn't let me finish. I right? know. Over a period of thousands of years, you've had several hundreds of thousands of ethics philosophers who studied the okay. Christian text, who, who can, okay. who, who, who done independent research, to come to the conclusion that the ethics, the ethical principles found within Christianity are the most fundamental when it comes to any ethical framework. That's um, not true. Okay, okay. The fact that can, I, can I interrupt real quick? Sure. Let, let me ask oh you something. God. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, I know. Wait, oh, my God. Fuck me. Um, here's what we'll do, Matthew. Since I don't want to hear you whine, I'm just going to mute you while John asks his question, then we'll unmute you. Yeah, it's really quick. I would love to hear the justification um, for Leviticus 25, 44 through 46. Now, I know you're going to say this is the Old Testament, not the New Testament, but even in the New Testament, uh, Jesus affirms the laws of Moses and all this other stuff. Plus, there's the thousands of years that Christians have used the Old Testament in order to enforce chattel slavery through the African slave trade, as well as, uh, you know, prior to the African uh, slave trade, um, they they also use these texts in order to justify the slavery of of other peoples. So um, the the whole New Testament argument doesn't really work, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I would love for you to justify why it's okay uh, for people to take p other people as property like chattel slavery. I'm not saying antebellum South slavery specifically, but antebellum, antebellum South slavery is chattel slavery, which is the same kind of slavery that was practiced in the Old Testament in Israel. And if, um, you know, Christianity uh, is, is the end all be all to morality and, and ethical living, um, then you have to be able to explain why this God proclaimed that, or you have to specially plead for it. That's, that's my hypothesis, but I'm wondering how, how you can explain that. Look, I, I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and last time I checked, Jesus had uh, how many slaves again? Can you remind me? I mean, I'm, I'm a mythicist, so I don't oh, think Jesus oh, oh, yeah, actually exists oh, yeah, at that's all. That's right. That's right. He had excuse zero. Me. He had zero slaves. I, excuse yeah, me, right. Matthew. Um, Matthew, does it? Matthew, why does it matter whether or not Jesus had slaves if the Bible says he could have? And do you think Jesus is God? We don't do Old Testament. The Old you Testament don't do has Old been Testament. fulfilled. The, no, the no, no. Old, the Old Testament. Testament. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Matthew, but you don't get to do that. See, the Old Testament includes. <laughs> You can laugh you all you want. Man, my belief. You, can, you can't I'm, do that. I'm not going to. Okay, I can do whatever the fuck I want on my show, but you can sit there and smugly laugh and listen. But if you throw out the Old Testament, what you what you throw out is the origin of everything, including original sin. And without original sin, there's nothing to be saved from or to. What you throw out is the entirety of the law, which some I never of which. Threw it out. You did. did you said that? we don't do the Old Testament. No, I said, Interrupt I said me. We stop interrupting it. me. Stop interrupting me. Stop interrupting me while I'm schooling you. This is where you learn. You can't you throw out anything. the old. You're straw manning my argument, and you straw I'm not straw my belief. anything. Oh, Matthew, I don't. I no longer think you're serious about this because it says here that you're asserting that the that human secularism is flawed because secularism is a system of do what thou wilt. But that's not what secularism is. So already in what you told the oh, call now screener, you're changing the topic. Awesome. No, awesome. no, sir. No, Matthew. 
I'm here's what the cut the thing says from the call screener. You must accept human secularism is flawed. The system of ethics is do what thou wilt. Religion has the superior ethics. It's had thousands of years to develop its ethics. Did you tell all that to the That's call a screener? True statement. Did you tell all that to the statement. call screener? Did you tell all that to the call screener? Yes, and that's a true statement. Then shut your pie hole because I'm not straw manning you. You are wrong about secularism because no, it is not. My beliefs. You're saying that I'm going to mute you because you're an idiot. And I'm not sorry. I'm not remotely sorry because I don't think you're honest. You're going to sit here and be, you're straw manning me. You, I literally asked you, did you tell this to the call screener? And you said yes. And now I'm correcting you, not on your beliefs, but on mine, motherfucker. Secular humanism is not summed up as do what thou wilt. That is a particular version of Satanism um, called Thelema. Uh, that is advocated by uh, Aleister Crowley. That is not secular humanism. It is not humanism. The secular humanist manifestos, neither version one, version two, or nor version three, includes do what thou wilt. So now that you know better about what humanism is, are you willing to retract that first sentence where you asserted falsely that humanism is do what thou wilt? Are you going to retract that? It is do what thou wilt. You have nothing. You have no foundation. That. Are you going to retract that? Or not? Are you going to track retract that or not? I will only retract it if you can demonstrate the foundation within human ethics. Go ahead, show me. Um, first of all, human ethics is a broad category. You said secularism, and I talked okay, about secular, secular human, human ethics. Shut can you show the me secular human up. ethics? Shut the fuck up while I'm talking. You, congratulations, Matthew. You will not get to speak for more than three seconds for the rest of this show. So just sit your ass on hold. Secular humanism has three different manifesto revisions over the years that tell you what the foundations of human ethics are from a secular humanist perspective. You don't get to come in and pretend that secular humanism is do what thou wilt. That is the lima. That is a version of Satanism that isn't humanism. You asserted that. I've now offered you the correction. Are you going to retract it or am I going to hang up on you? Which is it? I'll happily retract it if you can, if you can clarify. I, no, you don't get to put an if on it. I don't need to clarify shit. You don't get to waste any more time on the show. And you spoke for three seconds, which is exactly what I predicted. You are a cartoon, Matthew, and I've hung up on you. Uh, don't bother calling back in today or any other day because you are a parody. I don't believe that Christians are stupid enough, generally, to come up with secular humanism is do what thou wilt and then not be willing to be corrected while claiming that I'm strawmanning your beliefs when I've not strawmanned your beliefs. You're asserting that you get to throw out the Old Testament and that Christian ethics is the result of countless philosophers perusing the Christian texts. No, God is unchanging in the Bible. God is unchanging. You don't get to claim that morality used to be one way and then God changed his mind. You don't get to just ignore the entire Old Testament. You are a cartoon. You are a fraud. I don't believe for a second that you are an honest interlocutor trying to defend any version of Christianity. I'm going to bet that you're a little internet troll looking for a sound clip and a bite. So here you go. Pull this sound clip out. Matthew from Brisbane, Australia, you are the stupidest person I've had any the displeasure of talking to today. You don't understand secular ethics. You don't understand humanism. You don't understand Satanism. You don't understand Christianity. You are the most easy to spot non-Christian troll I've ever engaged with. And you've called twice now. So goodbye. All right. Back to something potentially real. Blaine in Nova Scotia, you are on, uh, you're on the hang up with Matt and John. Hey, um, so I have a question and it might sound really silly because you guys know a lot more about this than I do, but I often hear that the Bible doesn't contain external corroborative evidence. And so from what I understand, the gospels all existed independently of themselves. They were external and corroborative, but at one time we, we condensed them all into what we call the Bible now. So <clears throat> is it fair to say that there was no external corroborative evidence 
Does that make sense? I hope I explained myself properly. Uh, before we get into this call, Blaine, can you move your mic slightly away from your face? We're getting a lot of peaking oh, okay. yep. when you're talking. Yeah, sorry Thank about you. that. No worries. Yeah. Um, so w- the Bible's not going to contain extra biblical evidence because then it wouldn't be extra biblical. To say that there aren't uh, extra biblical contemporary accounts for Jesus, which is what I would normally say, is just true. But also, those Gospels are not contemporary accounts as well. They're anonymous. We, we don't know mm-hmm. who actually wrote them. But right. what we do know is that there were other books, plenty of other early Christian writings, that didn't make it into the book. So what you have are the ones that were selected from a biased perspective to be an account. Mm-hmm. So if the objection is, hey, you're looking at the Bible's 66 books, but in reality, you're looking at four Gospels and saying, why these four Gospels instead of the Gospel of the Egyptians or the Gospel of the Hebrews or um, the Gospel of Peter or the Edgerton Gospel? Why didn't any of those get in the infancy Gospel of James, the infancy Gospel of Thomas? Um, Each of those, there's there's reasoning. Basically, there was fighting and arguing that went on um that resulted in the canonization but once the canonization process is over and you have the four gospels that essentially made it in from that point forward it is completely fair to say that there are no extra biblical contemporary accounts that in any way confirm Mm -hmm. any aspect of jesus's life okay yeah Yeah, that makes that makes sense well, so like, and you might get some people out there that would quote some other extra biblical portions, but in, in my personal opinion, I don't think that we can actually definitely separate them from the gospels. Uh, Cause a lot of them seem to just repeat what we already find in the gospels. I mean, considering how early that the gospels were put into circulation uh, because uh, you have to understand um, with with the Gospels, what you have is Mark come, coming first, and we actually have some r- pretty good evidence that Mark was uh, informed by Paul's work, Paul's letters to dif- the different churches, and then mm-hmm. Matthew uh, co- it, 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 at least copies from Mark, and then Luke definitely copies from Matthew and Mark, and there's some debate in the scholarly community about what other sources Luke and Matthew might have had. Regardless of all of that, you definitely have Mark coming first, Matthew coming second, using Mark. Luke used both Mark and Matthew, and then John. The best that we can really place John is like second century, Um, but the the range that scholars Mm -hmm. regularly accept uh, extends Mm -hmm. to like the very late first century on, and on into the second century. So you're talking about um, books or, or stuff that was written well after the first generation of Christians, uh, like right at the time mm-hmm. when any eyewitnesses or anybody would be dying off. That's when Mark was being written. And so there's just like, there's no way as, as far as extra biblical sources for anything that's contained in the gospels or even, Paul, for that matter, we just simply don't have any good evidence that we can definitely, like for sure, 100% say is not informed by the Gospels uh, or Paul's work. And so that's that's kind of where it stands right now. Until we find better evidence that we have to just simply say, I, I don't know, like what what is actually, uh, you know, corroborated by outside sources. But to, to your, the heart of your question, which is, is it fair to say there's no extra biblical accounts of Jesus? Uh, yes, because there's not any biblical accounts either that are contemporary. So even the four gospels, they're not contemporary accounts that confirm or affirm anything. So it's worth it to, to point out that we don't have any. Sure, yeah, I, th- that's fair. No, I, I understand that. Um, that really answers my question. Can I just ask a, a quick question? Uh, for Matt, I didn't ask this to the call screener, but it's really, it's really just super yes or no, kind of. Go for it. Uh, yeah. 
So if God doesn't exist, then how the fuck did you get with Arden? Uh, I'm amazing. Thanks for noticing. <clears throat> you, would you like verification? I already, I already dropped the call just because, you know, uh, cool. Uh, hey, honey, you want to verify that it's because I'm amazing? It's true. You're very impressive. Definitely. <laughs> She said Those that skills. so unconvincingly. <laughs> uh, thanks for the backup. So, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm starting to think that God does exist and he's punishing me with callers. <laughs> it could be the case. Alex in Oklahoma, you are on the air with John and Matt. How are you? Oh, hey, guys. How's it going? Um, I really appreciate you guys answering. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really massive honor to speak to you, Matt, um, and you, John, as well. Um, I've, I've been listening to you, or not listening and, and watching you guys like uh, pretty much like twenty four seven. So uh, anyway, oh I just had God. a few questions. Take a walk or something. Well, and and don't put your earbuds in. Just take a walk where you're like listening to the birds. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can try that. I'm sorry, um, keep going. Oh, you're fine. Um, well, um, uh, so uh, every time I've, uh, I've spoken to uh, like a family member or someone who I know who is a um, like a devout Christian, um, I, I try to ask just hypothetical questions or just questions that I view as reasonable. Um, and like one of them is, um, you know, Jesus was just, he was just a guy who, who said he was the son of a Babylonian deity. Um, and I mean, that's, that's obviously if someone did that today, it, it wouldn't get very far. And the same thing would probably happen to them. Um, how, like, but whenever, whenever I, I mention that, like they usually just explode in anger when they refuse to speak to me. How, I mean, is there a way to reason with that? Or I should just, just avoid speaking or asking those kind of questions around those kind of people. Well, I, I think the phrasing saying that Jesus was just a guy who claimed to be the son of a Babylonian deity um, is a ridiculously inaccurate framing. Okay. <clears throat> well, yeah, and I mean, if you're looking to have productive conversations with, like, people that you know or people that you care about or just people in general I, I feel like doing your best to you know I, I guess break through whatever reverence that they have for their faith in general is probably a better tactic and and by that i just mean that you know going to that kind of extreme while it may be you know I guess popular on on social media because you'll get reinforced by other other atheists, other other people. Um, when you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I feel like what you want to do is 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 more or less focus on getting them to start questioning questioning like what they think about God and and their faith in general, and and typically that's going to be done with with little. Um, you know, small little things that you can poke, you know, in, in their ideology, like, you know, pointing out the okay. contradiction of, of God's morality, uh, you know, thinking that, that you need God in order to know what's good. But God also said that, you know, um, the, the main founder of, of the Israelite people, the chosen people by God, uh, he worked for 14 years to buy a wife you know, two wives, actually two wives for them. And so like, I don't, I wouldn't understand how you could base like the one true religion off of essentially, you know, purchasing women. I mean, 
I feel like maybe coming at it as like, well, these are the problems that I have with it. These are the issues that I have trouble getting over and, and accepting. Can you maybe help me if you phrase it in a way? And I got this from my wife, actually. If you can phrase it in a way to where you're asking them for help, like help me understand this. But then you, you know, you tell them like, oh, well, doesn't that mean this? Like get them to sort of slowly logically think through the ideology that they're trying to convince you of. I feel like that can be a lot more productive than, you know, going uh, too, too hard at them as far as, you know, trying to do an, uh, uh, uh abduct you ad absurdum, I believe is, is what it's called. Like reduce, reducing the idea to its most absurd kind of understanding. Um, uh, uh reductio, yeah. sorry, reductio, uh, ad absurdum. Um, instead of going that route, like actually asking questions, doing more of a Socratic thing and, and asking questions and get them to explain how this makes sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a much better way to go about it. And, uh, as far as like how to effectively do that, I would definitely suggest people like, um, uh, Anthony Magna Bosco on YouTube, as well as any of the street epistemology uh, channels that you can find on YouTube. Any of those people, um, can definitely show you the most effective way to, you know, communicate with people that have different views than you and get them to actually logically think through the ideology that they currently hold without offending them. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, I have, uh, could I have one last question for you guys? Um, uh, so, um, on the slavery thing, uh, that's, those are videos I watch a lot of you guys is, um, and I, I really love how you guys handle the topic. Uh, but whenever I bring up, bring that up, that topic up, it's, yeah, it, it always ends up with them just, just ignorantly defending it and, and like, they literally say, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with slavery. It's totally cool with me. And it was fine. And and then yeah they kind of get kind of uh almost kind of violent like not physical but you can see it um anyway uh what would you guys' take on that be i handle it i can you do, do the question one more time um <clears throat> uh okay so if I, I heard you to, saying that you'd, you'd watch this videos of us talking about slavery and then you're asking how would we recommend to talk about slavery it was that the question uh yes just um just exactly the way i do in the videos the 30 minute video that okay. i have up there with all the details about that so one of the reasons that yeah. i that i cried foul at the beginning is just for fun i'm going to list the babylonian gods and you tell me which one jesus claimed to be the son of Enlil, Enki, Inanna, Nabu, Nanasun, Ninharasag, or Utu? I'll save you the time. The answer is none of those. So when you say Jesus just a dude who claimed to be the son of a Babylonian god, anybody who knows what they're talking about knows that you don't. And that's why you're probably getting that reaction, especially when you have jews and christians standing up in opposition to or their religions standing up in opposition to babylonian gods and so you know most people most people aren't going to know any of that but they're going to just oh jesus didn't claim to be the son of a babylonian god it's it's a silly little thing to to make a good argument bad by adding details that aren't accurate so to whatever extent okay. jesus did whether or not Jesus existed, the way the Bible portrays Jesus as he didn't, he didn't actually claim to be, he didn't word for word claim to be the son of any God, and he didn't word for word claim to be God, but his actions suggest that he put himself co-equal with God before Abraham was, I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, that sort of thing. Um, but the God that he's talking about is, you know, the Old Testament God, Yahweh, uh, not not the Babylonian gods, and Babylon okay, it, is, it, is the bad guy in the in the Bible, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just 
completely my mistake then. I I was thinking yeah, Yahweh was a um, I was thinking he was a Babylonian god just because um, well, Abraham was from Iraq, right? Sumer. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, thank okay. you, Matt. I appreciate well, you guys if, uh, if, taking my call. John's got something. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it, yeah. It, if I could add real quick, I think that maybe what you're trying to get at um, is is more along the lines of syncretism, because the the gospel version of Jesus, which I th I feel like both Matt and I would agree that the gospel version of Jesus is um, not a real person. Uh, you know, there's a lot of magical aspects of the gospels, and uh, the theology that's uh, that is espoused by the gospels is is very <laughs> magical in nature or or at least supernatural in nature and um and i don't mean to speak for you matt on that particular point but i, I would think that you wouldn't think that the gospel of jesus is real um but syncretism mm -hmm. is a very specific kind of topic there in that syncretism involves taking surrounding cultures finding similar aspect or, or finding certain aspects of these similar religions and cultures and then molding your idea of of this god or or the savior figure like jesus is purportedly supposed to be to to embody a lot of the characteristics of these surrounding cultures like hellenistic mystery religions as well as um other other religions in the area and i think that you're that's probably where you're wanting to go, even though that's not exactly what you said. Uh, I feel like going a more uh, syncretistic route is probably better. So I, I would just suggest looking up what syncretism is and how syncretism factors into the development of, of Christian theology, because you'll find that there's a lot of aspects to the gospel version of Jesus that aligns pretty well with other religions that were popular in the area. And this is all due to syncretism. So syncretism isn't copying. Syncretism is taking these aspects and then finding those aspects in your already existing religion and then being like, well, hey, those people over there have a savior that does this. We already have one of those in our religion, so it's already better than the ones that are making this stuff up. And so it's, it's, it's a main selling point for these religions at the time to be like, well, ours is better because ours is not only Jewish, but it's already doing these things. And so th I feel like that is a better direction to go with it. I wouldn't necessarily start with that with a general believer. You know, that's something that you would probably have to get to eventually. But I feel like that's the direction that you're meaning to head, even though that's not what you literally said, if that makes any kind of sense. And, and while yeah, I, does, um, I, I yeah, think John's I'll, probably right. I think John's probably right about a good chunk of that. I'd also recommend exercising some caution in the sense that syncretism is essentially the merging of views. It's, you know, and, and sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. One of the reasons that we can be fairly confident that the ancient Israelites were not enslaved in Egypt is because we don't see syncretism of beliefs or the, the merging of different beliefs um, and we don't see evidence of them or their time in Egypt or anything else. But there are plenty of people who are really good at patterns recognition um, or maybe hyperactive pattern recognition who see syncretism where it isn't. So like when you start talking about, oh, um, Christianity just stole all these things uh, from pagan religions that make up what Christmas is. A good chunk of what you'll find there about Christmas is just false. Uh, most of, mostly Christmas was invented uh, in the 19th century. Um, and it wasn't, uh, oh, Christianity didn't have to adopt a, a pagan tree or any of this other stuff. When you dig into the history of those things, that's not tied to the merging of religion. So this, be very careful. The best thing you can do, which I would agree, you should definitely go out and look up um, how syncretic beliefs are merged in form, but uh, ask questions. Instead of going in and saying, here's who Jesus was, or here's what Christianity was, or here's what Christianity is, ask them to defend what their beliefs are. Um, trust me, Matthew from earlier 
uh, is is not what you're likely to engage with because Matthew's a fraud and a troll who actually should have been banned before dropping the N word mm -hmm. a week or so ago when he uh, called in um, from the oh, same wow. IP address in Brisbane, but I missed it. Um, but anyway, uh, hey, hi, troll. I know you're still watching. I know how much you want to blow me. It's never going to happen. Um, but when you go through that stuff, when you're talking to the believers, all you got to do is ask them questions because you're not in a position where you have any burden of proof or anything to defend. They're the ones who believe something. They're the ones who believe they have the truth. They're the ones who are commanded by God, according to their religion, to be prepared at all times to give the reason for the faith that's within them. So all you've got to do is ask them questions. And if you get to any point in the conversation where something doesn't sound right, or it's not making sense, or you don't understand it, or you don't have an answer, or it's beyond it, just say, okay, thank you. Let me jot that down. I'll go off and think about it, and we can carry on the conversation another time, because you're not on a live TV show where things have to finish in 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you guys very much for your time. And uh, all right. All right. thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Alex. Thank, thank you, Alex. Uh, I, right. I saw somebody in the comments mention Horace. I really wish people would stop <laughs> mentioning Horace. I even, even as a mythicist myself, I hate it when people like I cringe when people bring up the whole Horace thing, because that's a horrible comparison to bring up. And I, I would definitely suggest people not make that comparison. One might even say it's Horaceable. All right. That's a really bad. <laughs> That's a really bad dad joke there, but hey, yay, John and I found something in it we're in agreement on on mythicism, which actually there's quite a, there's quite a loads of things that we're in agreement on even within mythicism. But the Horus thing, yeah, it's when you get into the astro theology aspect and you start saying, oh, this is just like this and just like this and just like this. Um, the fact that there's little bitty bits of things that are similarity similar between various deities and various stories is wholly unsurprising when you have human beings are trying to explain the world and how it works and where we came from and they're, you know, dipping into magic. And it's, it's just like, there's a whole bunch of superheroes. Um, and some of them have the exact same powers. Some of them were copied off each other. Some of them weren't. It's, you know, all right. Before we get on to the next call, um, which is another non-theist, I guess the real theists, the people who genuinely believe in some kind of God are just not going to bother calling in to defend this. They'd rather let absolute fraudulent trolls like Matthew um, come in and just make a mockery of what it is they believe instead of actually calling in to say, hey, here's what I actually believe and why and why I think you guys should too. Because if anybody had a valid argument supported by independently verifiable objective evidence um, not only would I believe the claim, but I'm pretty sure that you would have two godless heathens here, uh, who convert almost on the spot based on a, a, a good argument supported by real evidence. And in 19 years or so of doing these call-in shows, um, well, that still hasn't happened. And it's, it, it's strange to me, but we'll see. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting to see if we get more calls queued up, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and your support for the line network overall. Don't forget to click like and subscribe and share this and watch the clips and do all the other stuff that you want to do. Um, but you can also go to, whoops, I, I dropped my little note. <laughs> You can not only support by clicking like and subscribe and by becoming a member on the channel, you can also go to linemerch.com where there is plenty of merchandise up there for you right now, including, oh, look, John had a little wine glass, but you've got your on the line shirts, the line mugs, which are now dishwasher safe, and there's uh, hoodies up there. Have you, got, have you got like cold bullets in there to stir it with or something? Oh yeah, and so there, there. It's bullet whiskey stones. I, I, it's the nice. most Murica thing that I've ever seen, like on Amazon. So I was like, I got to get me some bullet whiskey stones. That's awesome. Uh, it, so yeah, and I've, I've also stopped mixing my whiskey. I've just drink it straight now. By the way, I remember what, you what, chastising me a little bit before. Oh. <laughs> 
drinks whatever you want. I, I like a whiskey sour, but I'm going to give people shit all the time for drinks. What, have you, are you drinking bourbon or? Uh, I think, well, this is actually Irish whiskey right now, but normally ah. I have straight bourbon on hand. Um, so go. I, I, when, I, when I got my whiskey haul a couple weeks ago, I mixed up some Irish whiskey with some straight bourbon. And so, uh, it, it's got, I got a nice mixture downstairs. <laughs> See, John, John and I could drink together, but we, we wouldn't be having the same drinks. Uh, but also <laughs> I, I don't drink that much. And, you know, I, I like, I like some good bourbons. Uh, I, I'm not good. At, I'm not big on single malt or scotch whiskey but who knows i i don't know shit. i like i like my tequila um i like a little bourbon on occasion but yes linemerch.com now now that we're no longer distracted is where you want to go if you want to get those nice hoodies um so you know if you're if you're ready for the your gay homie uh hoodies and stuff they're available there in addition you can go to patreon.com uh slash call the line and support there and you can go to q a line.com for the main website for the line network and that's where you can go to apply to end boss which we will be starting in just a couple of weeks um where uh, william will be showing up to defend um i believe it's the bodily ascension of christ if i'm not mistaken um but i'm also Damn. doing a debate on good friday on that so it's good stuff then while we're queuing up other calls, we have Terry on hold from Arkansas, pronouns are he, him. Uh, Terry's a substitute teacher who wants to talk about shoot, school shootings. So welcome, Terry. I, I thought we were done with school shootings. Thank you for not letting us be done, genuinely. Uh, sorry, Matt. Sorry, John. No, uh, not. Well, I, I can pretend to be a theist uh, if you want. I, that, that I've already had enough pretenders anyway. for one day. I've had one douche oh. nozzle pretender. I don't need any <laughs> atheist that I, I might actually like doing it so yeah let's let's talk about I it i don't know how you do it uh yeah i was uh you know thinking about it and i you know i heard your opening bit and uh you know you had no answers and who does other than you know your heart sinking and just thinking about it and like where have we gone wrong and what we can do and i i was thinking to myself what what can we do what can be done about this it's it's got to be this complete shift in the minds of the people and but what I can do and what I found out that seems to work is to, I, you can recognize kids that, uh, that you think are just out there a little, you know, there's something not right about them. They don't seem like all the other kids falling in line, learning and having a good day at school and that kind of thing. They're angry about something. You, you pick up on it, you know, whether anybody likes them, they sit alone or they're acting out. And, and I can, I can help that instead of hindering, like ignoring it or, you know, having it, somebody else deal with it. That's not my way. I think what teachers in my schools that I get to sub in, what they do is um, they're really proactive and, and community minded and that kind of thing. And I'm lucky in that regard. You know, I don't, uh, I don't get to work in the big cities and have to deal with that insanity. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you, I engage with these kids that, uh, that I see that are, uh, you know, on the spectrum out on one side or the other, and, and, I, and I just uh, make sure that they're okay. You know, I kind of I pride myself on being one of these cool guys, a cool sub. Uh, cool, cool AF is what I've been referred to as, which always made me laugh. Anyway, uh, it's just recognizing it and, and just befriending them seeing if they're okay and just offering a kind word you know it's uh, i'm a, of the age where i know a kind word how long how much it can weigh what it can do and uh you, you a kid that's having a bad life you know he is his, his home life surely sucks you can see that it does and you, you say something like hey nice shirt something simple like that and you get you get such a reaction and you know i, I swear i think about like before I took this job, the first thing that crossed my mind was like, holy shit, school shootings, man. I'm going to, this is going to be wild, you know? And at the same time, I've got a kid in the school system and it never really crossed my mind that she was in danger, which is, seems kind of selfish on my part, but maybe it's because I feel safe in our community and, and it's just, I don't know. But when I stepped into that arena, it, it was on my mind right away. It was, but after, you know, a few weeks, 
I don't know. I just like coming to school that the next morning, it, the thought just never entered back. It, it just never came back into my head like it did before I started there. Was when it was like this major concern, I thought about, oh, my God, school shooting. Here I am. I'm going to be in this. It's going to happen. Fortunately for us up here, it hasn't happened. If, if a student has a gun in a school, the the cops, it's like the SWAT team show up to the schools. And it, it's a huge deal. Like there are consequences to your actions in, in, in this school district anyway. Um, Wait, you're, I, I you're in Alaska, not Arkansas, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I got and, that wrong. Know, Alaska, I got the, I got, I got the, the, the state code wrong and in, said Arkansas earlier, my apologies. Um, but w when you're, when you're dealing with this potential and you, you know, you're working with kids, I get that you, you say you can often spot, you know, it's one of the, one of the unfortunate side jobs of teachers is having the duty to spot troubled kids. Do you, what resources do you have when you spot someone who's troubled so that you can do more than just, you know, be the cool AF teacher and potentially, you know, like what are your resources that are available to get somebody who you think is a potential uh, danger to themselves or others, some help? The, the, the staff at the school, the, the school I've been subbing at primarily, first off, I have a, a, a choice of, I think 37 or 40 different schools to choose from, uh, to sub on any given day. And I can pick elementary, middle school, high school, career tech, whatever. Um, but I've been consistently staying at a particular high school, which is in the, you know, the better side of town. And it's probably the better school, um, probably more resources. And that being said, the resources are first is to, you know, if it's not an immediate concern, I could just leave a note for the teacher and, and it will certainly be, be followed up on from my experience um if that's not the the staff secretary all of the principals vice principals the counselors uh the athletic staff it, it seems that every teacher has every teacher's back unless you've you know alienated them in some other weird way because you're just a weirdo teacher or whatever and there's plenty of those out there but um, the, the resources are great. Every, you know, room has a phone. We do that, the alert thing and the lockdown procedures. That's all down. That's, that's not, kids, that's you know, not quite what I'm talking about, Terry. Or, earlier we were talking about oh. chaplains in the military and, and John was talking about the potential of chaplains, um, in schools. And I'm looking at, you know, what, what's like, if you spot someone that's having difficulty apart from other teachers having your back, I mean, are there trained counselors within the school district that you can potentially send people to? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't make that clear. Absolutely. The counselors here are, uh, as far as I can see top notch, like I, I'm pretty sure every counselor at a minimum has a master's in education in, in our school district. And John, I agree. And Matt with you, the, the idea of replacing them with, you know, if the chaplains just show any case study where any of that stuff has actually worked to help a kid, that would be good, you know. Uh, but yes, there are, there is a, a, a pretty good uh, system of resources for troubled kids up here. Um, it doesn't seem to be too politicized either way. Um, doesn't seem to be economic based. But I'm speaking from a, a, the populated areas the the majority of the state is a bush community and and the education system out there is a whole different ball game that i i don't really know much about other than it's doesn't have money and it's not good yeah well i i appreciate the call terry hopefully we yeah, can yeah uh, thanks hopefully you continue um, to be yeah, just hope no more uh, right yeah yeah a useful resource for the kids up there in alaska uh, and I encourage anybody out there who's doing nothing, subbing's great, man. It's like, it's such a good thing. And you get to pick and choose the days you work. <laughs> All right, you guys, good talking with you. Thanks, Jerry. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. <sighs> I want to, first of all, I didn't have much to add about that.
<laughs> no, it's, I, I, I don't know that there was anything to that. I was trying to trying to steer that in a way where we could look for something. But you know, yeah, I would say that I for people who are looking for something to do that might be helpful, maybe becoming a substitute teacher and getting involved in in the system um, can help defend against encroaching religiosity in schools. Can you know defend against uh, religious privilege in schools? Um, but also, you may be the one person that can help kids without trying to talk them into going to your church type thing, uh, because we know that stuff happens. Um, but uh, what well, real quick, I want to thank uh, Amargan and Dylan and uh, Cookies and all of our moderators here in chat and Phoebe for screening the calls today. We got more calls and um, some interesting potential conversations. So here we go. Not about God at all, but Darko uh, in uh, oh Victoria, Australia. So Bronson, hey, 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 can question. you hear me? Welcome. We hear you. Oh yeah, hey. that's great. Hopefully a better representative than the uh, previous uh, call from Australia. So I want to. Sorry, I have a bit of trouble hearing what you're saying. No, it's fine. You, your mic is peaking a little bit. I'm getting a couple pops, so you might want to just move uh, it slightly away from your mouth. Lay, is this better now, or uh, hopefully? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So I want to talk about the um, ethics behind whether or not, let's say, you know, sex work, prostitution, stuff like that, should be legal, particularly because in, let's say, Australia, the issue split. Like some states have it completely banned. Other states have it like it's allowed, and it's kind of made me a little bit stuck. Uh, personally, I go with, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. And I was having this discussion with my brother's also an atheist, but um, we get a little bit divisive on this because he's actually against it both morally and even um, thinks it should be illegal. And so we don't, so we, so we don't, um, you know, I don't, I get a bit stuck on what should be allowed and what should be allowed. So the way he would make it personal is, for example, he would say, okay, so what do you think, um, yeah, so he would ask me, what do you think, uh, should it be allowed or should it be, not, should it be illegal? Sorry, uh, a bit nervous. And um, like, I, I'm okay with that, but then he would make it personal by saying, so imagine it was your daughter, for example, who she was doing well in school, she was, um, you know, doing university and all that, and then all of a sudden she stopped and she started to engage in sex work. How would you feel about it? Well, then that's where it, uh, became, uh, because it became a little bit more personal, that's where I went, well, I don't think I would like it. However, I don't think that should have an influence on whether or not it should be legal or not. So that's where I get a bit stuck on because he would make arguments for why it is bad. For example, there are high rates of suicide. Uh, a lot of them have, uh, have bad mental health, a higher rates of bloodborne infections and stuff like that. He would pull out all these stats. And that's just where I get a bit stuck. I'm not sure what's the right way of resolving this. I hope that makes a bit sense. Well, one thing I'd say is it shouldn't make any difference whether or not it's your daughter, your partner, your mom, you know, um, what we legalize. We, the last thing we want to do is base our, our, our laws on personal biases. So mm. when somebody's like, what if it was your daughter? Well, I don't have a daughter, but if I had a daughter and she wanted to get involved with sex work, I would want it to be legal and regulated to keep her as safe as possible. And by the way, right, um, yeah. mm. why, why on earth are we defaulting to what if it was your daughter? What if it's your son? I mean, we, we mm. don't need to gender yeah. this. Sex work is real work. There are sex workers of virtually any gender or gender combination or gender identity that you can come up with um, doing sex work. It's real work. It is, should be allowed under individual, individual freedom and bodily autonomy. And we need it to be decriminalized and regulated enough that we can end sex trafficking. We can uh, decrease the risks involved with it. We can make sure that somebody doesn't have um, a pimp that's taking all their money and beating them and, and making it so that they, you know, 
They are stuck doing this forever for someone else. There's a difference between doing it for yourself to make money and doing it for someone else. And those things, all the worst parts of sex work exist when it's illegal. Sex works doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go away. And all of those things exist at their peaks when it's illegal, because when you operate outside of the law, you no longer have the protection of the law. And and I, w- I would just like to add that <clears throat> whenever you're coming up in these conversations and you have somebody that's like, well, there's higher rates of STDs and all this other stuff, I, I would definitely question what they're comparing, because you could have a false analogy uh, here or, or a false comparison, maybe not a false analogy, but a false comparison. Cause if you're going to compare unre- unregulated, uh, sex work to regulated sex work, I feel like you're going to run into a, a pretty big problem. Like, like Matt pointed out, because if you look into the regulated sex work, like in, uh, Las Vegas, or I know in, in Australia, they, they have some, uh, regulations and I don't know if all areas or some areas, um, but normally, like they're they're pretty heavily regulated in that they you know rec- like um, regulated um, sex workers uh, you know have uh, better access to healthcare. Um, there's also different requirements in order to be in that profession and, and things of that nature to uh, you know prevent the the spreading of of sexually transmitted diseases and stuff. So I would just caution of you know, whoever is throwing those kinds of things out to make sure that you're comparing or, or at least working off of statistics from uh, sex work that is regulated, uh, legalized, and where women uh, and, and men, like Matt said, no need to be gendered here, just anybody is protected under the law. I feel like that is the best representation for this because otherwise you're just talking about, you know, illegal activities and the limitations that come with that being that they're not protected. They're not, uh, you know, they don't have the law on their side in that, you know, they're easily exploitable and, um, they, they, there's just a whole bunch of things that can occur in that. Now I'm not trying to, you know, say that like I'm an expert in this, this is just what I've been able to glean from what I've heard from, you know, uh, uh, different, um, either academic sources or just, uh, on, online, uh, sources. Um, I just would be very careful from a very skeptical point of view about what you're comparing, where your data is being, uh, der- derived from. Mm, yeah. And I think also like some of the statistics and stuff that it's hard to differentiate between whether it was legal or illegal sex work. So they're not entirely accurate. I, yeah, I, I think I'm starting to see that now a bit more. Also, I like the, um, uh, the touch on like it could be also be your son, it could be anyone, not to just make this a gender issue. Someone in the chat even said it could be a granddad. So uh, I, I guess that's I guess that's true. That's something I could consider. Um, another I guess another argument you would make is like you would say, well, you know, if if we know that it can be um, like troublesome and stuff, why doesn't the government then regulate like drugs and stuff like cocaine and stuff? You know, if and then I, I don't know, I get a bit lost. <laughs> I don't know if you, what, what, you know, what do you, what do you mean? Why doesn't the government do that? Governments do regulate drugs. Oh, no, I mean, like, you know, like the like harsh drugs, like let's say cocaine or something, or let's say just marijuana. Governments do regulate those drugs. Governments do All regulate right. those drugs, they make them illegal. That's what regulation is. If you All make right, something right, illegal, yeah. you've, you've regulated it. But I, I but guess, if you're talking guess, about, then, uh, if, if hang on, hang on. If you're asking why don't we decriminalize drugs, I'm in favor of that too. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm in favor of people's freedoms. I'm in favor of people using drugs if they want to under the right circumstances. You get regulated drugs. You, 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 you're no longer having to worry about, you know, is something tainted or whatever. The same reason I can go trust the food there. I'm in favor of sex work. I'm in favor of drugs. I'm in favor of individual liberties and freedoms. And so if you're asking why doesn't the government, de- why don't governments, because we're talking about two different ones, you're in Australia and we're not, um, why don't governments uh, decriminalize drugs? Some of them are. As a matter of fact, an interesting uh, thing I saw just yesterday is, um, oh my gosh, why can't I remember her name? I love her to pieces. 
She ran for president. What the hell's wrong with me? Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren, thank you. Elizabeth Warren just came out and basically said, we need to decriminalize marijuana. Now, I used to hate marijuana. I despised it. I had friends who smoked it all the time. It never really did much to me, but it turns out I was just an idiot uh, who, who either didn't inhale or got some oregano or whatever else. But uh, I like my brain when it's working properly. I don't generally like to be high around other people. I don't, I'm never high when I do the shows. I don't like when I go to conventions and stuff. Uh, I don't like to be high there because I feel like that's when I'm working. But I also have diabetic neuropathy um, and uh, there are frequent problems with sleeping. I have a chronic nerve pain and some other stuff. I've had a triple bypass. I'm, I've got all kinds of issues. I'm getting ready to go have oral surgery. I was getting an hour and a half to three hours of sleep a night until one of my ex-girlfriends said, hey, you should try this and got me some marijuana, which is not legal in Texas. So I, I was already in the, I don't want to do this because I'm violating the law. Um, and I'd rather, you know, I'd rather not, but I got sleep. And that's when I realized and found out shortly after that, that marijuana is actually legal everywhere in the United States, as long as you get Delta eight or THC zero or one of these others that are, that are making it through a loophole. You can get them at gas stations, porn shops, and anywhere and everywhere. And now I sleep just fine because after doing all of my other work during the day and everything's over, if it feels like a night where I'm having pain or if I'm not sleeping or if I just want to be high and watch TV, I've got legal weed. Um, and the question then is, yes, but should you do that for cocaine or heroin or whatever else? There are drugs that should be prohibited from general public where you have to go through some hurdle to get it because we know the consequences of just leaving it out there. So it's not like I'm in favor of decriminalizing all of it. I'm in favor of sensible laws. And the same thing for sex work. Saying I'm in favor of decriminalizing sex work doesn't mean that I think anything should go. Like we should allow any and all sex work. Uh, no, I. there are things that I'm I'm generally opposed to. But we're we're operating, as John was pointing out, based on a potential flawed data set comparing legal sex work to illegal sex work. And what we need, the best way to counter that is for more places to decriminalize things so we get better data on what should or shouldn't be decriminalized. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree it, with that. It, it, as far as the ethical nature of it, like, I, I really don't give a fuck what somebody else does with their own time. Like it, you know, I mean, like I, you know, if, if somebody else wants to do that, I mean, it, it's not affecting me. And if, and if I do have a problem with somebody close to me doing it, you know, then, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess you could cross that road when you get there, either, you know, don't talk to them or whatever, or, or, you know, if it's your significant other and that's not the kind of life that you want to have, then I, I guess, you know, you need to deal with it however you can deal with it. But as far as, as, as like it just being legalized in general and somebody that doesn't affect my life, like in the least bit doing it, I really don't fucking care <laughs> just <Yeah>. in general. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a, I'm in a position where, uh, of all of all of my uh, partners, wives, girlfriends, whatever, over over the last over the last fifteen years, all of them except for one have been involved in sex work at some point in their life in some way or another. And I say except for one, just because I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't know that this one individual was was ever involved in sex work in any way, but. You know, I don't know everything about everybody's life, but th the number of people and in particularly women who have been involved in sex work of some type at some point is doing nothing but increasing because, you know, only fans and whatever cam things. And this is a way for people to relatively safely, um, you know, make money, uh, that they're not going to make at Starbucks. And when you're trying to put yourself through school, it, you know, if, if you're stripping of the local cub versus doing, you know, 
cam shows and stuff, there are lots of opportunities and there are still risks. I'm not in any way saying, oh, let's legalize everything. I am not one of the batshit crazy libertarians that are just like, let's throw out all the laws. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a liberal Democrat with libertarian leanings probably. So that's the best I got, Darko. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's just uh, there's just such a stark contrast between what I'm seeing and then when you're talking. So when I still see your mouth moving, I just I get I, that's why I got a bit confused earlier. Anyways, yes, I I'm, I'm pretty much on par with everything you said. I would just add, like to add one thing uh, to what John said. He said you know earlier that he doesn't care about what anyone does, and I agree with him for the most part. When sometimes it becomes a little bit personal with, back to the example I gave, like let's say it's any of your children, for example, engage that. And even with uh, examples you provided to me, it's just hard to sometimes not take it personally you, and not let your own bias influence what you want for your children, you know? And that's, that's where it gets a bit hard in making the right decisions. But in, in society in general, I agree with like everything you said. Yeah, should make it regulated, legalized. Yeah. Yeah, it's... What we need to do is make the decision based on the best information. So if it turns out that I'm wrong, if it turns out that John's wrong, if it turns out that anybody and everybody's wrong, and there are really good reasons to make sex work of all sorts illegal, then we'll find out, but we need to find it out based on the best data, the best data sets out there. And we can't do that um, if we're operating on, on bad information. Hmm. I agree. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Uh, it gave me a lot more perspective. Uh, I now have some better arguments, and uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you so much for this call. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks for redeeming Australia. <laughs> awesome stuff. All right. So we've got uh, one more call to get to, and I'm thinking this is probably going to be the last call before we get on to super chats. As a reminder. Um, I'm sure I'll get my link shortly, but we will be, oh, I didn't bother to ask. John, are, are you good to stick around and answer, read all the super chats and stuff, or are you on a timetable? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I'm definitely going to have to cut out by about 8.30 or a little bit after that, but I should be able to we'll stick around for, for some comments then. Yeah, we'll be done by 8.30. Um, there's not a ton of super chats, but I got one more call I want us to get to, and that is... Um, Jaime in New York, pronouns are he, him, uh, active service person. So welcome, Jaime. Hey, man. Hey, John. How are you? Hope you're doing well. Um, uh, yes, I am. I can do the service. And, <laughs> thank and you. I, um, when I, when I thank you. When I joined in 2015, I was a, I was going to say semi-atheist, but I've, I've grown into a soft atheist ever since. However, I have... I found it across um, different units, and as I've uh, grown through the ranks, that um, uh, the chaplains have been of great service to, especially those who uh, are of said denominations, and as well as for some social work. And uh, I know the last, the other oh, previous caller, not previous, but um, earlier, said that um, when he was in the service, there was some, uh, there was it was harder to come by to get um, um, uh, social services and. Um, in behavioral health. However, I've seen that the stigma has been lifted somewhat, and they have been encouraging it so, uh, um, somewhat more, even since 2015 when I joined. And um, other changes that I've seen is that um, they have broadened the categories of religion to include many different um, um, humanists and whatnot. And I know the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers have been lobbying for that, yeah. and they have expanded it. Not, not, not greatly, uh, uh, not, not to everything, but I was able to change mine from just plain Judaism to a more specific uh, humanist um, denomination. Um, however, what I have seen um, where, where I struggle with this, and even though I agree with you that that there's some benefit to having chaplains in you know within our ranks, um, when I was downrange, when I was deployed overseas, and it hit me, and it kind of dawned on me whenever we would leave on mission. The chaplain wasn't just there readily available for those who wanted to pray before leaving on mission. They were essentially um, addressing the formation as they were leaving. And not that it was um, um, prohibited from leaving the formation 
not to partake in any prayer, but it would have been frowned upon and it was kind of, uh, you, you would have been standing out against what, um, what they were conducting, the prayers they were conducting before mission. And the question I posed to many of my fellow peers was, well, specifically in Afghanistan where I was, well, they're praying on the other side of the fence. And if we're going out and one is praying for one God, how are we any different if we're praying to a God, especially since we're separating church and state and we're technically a, um, a, 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 not re- a non-religious governmental agency, how can we allow for the chaplain to essentially hijack the formation to conduct prayer? And I can choose not to partake, but this is essentially um, graying the line between uh, church and state. So as much as I see the benefit of having a chaplain within the formation, I, I find it kind of abhorrent that they would immerse themselves right there um, as we are going to conduct whatever it is that we need to do out there um, and kind of impose their religious thought on, on service members, you know, which they have not even like asked to those who wanted to pray. It was just there and um, without considering anyone who doesn't want to pray or doesn't partake in that. Any thoughts? Well, that was kind of close to my old position. Um, and it's, it's going to be difficult because there's no way to have a chaplaincy as it exists now that isn't going to be, uh, misused. Uh, The intent of what it should be, um, you know, to provide religious counseling to service members who are religious, um, is fine. That's the part that I'm okay with. If you're going to have, especially if you're going to have a draft, you, you, you owe these people um, the, the counseling in, in accordance with their religious beliefs to some extent. The problem is there's no way it can ever be that because you can't have, like I was on an aircraft carrier for several years. There's five, 6,000 people on the aircraft carrier. There's not enough chaplains to cover every religious identity on that boat. And so there are people who are never going to have their religion represented by any member of the chaplaincy. And so what happens is the chaplaincy tends to dull everything down to Unitarian Universalist type stuff where let's let's just be okay for everybody, which means nobody's getting what they need or want. Or it becomes predominantly, here's a few flavors of Christianity, and then we get to impose and inject Christianity in the military. I don't know what a solution is for this because um, the arguments that I would have against this it are, I, I think are countered by the fact that we still could potentially draft people and that if you're going to take people out of their homes, put them in a position where they're going to need counseling and maybe face death, um, you know, some of them are going to want a priest. Some of them are going to want an imam. Some are, you know, who knows? I don't know what the solution is, but I know the chaplaincy is broken as is, and I don't see any way the chaplaincy can ever be what it's supposed to be. But if you remove it, I think if you removed it and you replaced it with science-based counselors who could then reach out to clergy members that are not in the military, not paid by the government, so you could have a, a clergy commission where every major religion gets to you know have its two or three or four representatives or whatever that these become kind of outsourced uh, military counselors. That might solve the problem, but I don't I don't know any way to actually solve it. <clears throat> well, if nothing else, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, uh, go ahead, John. Sorry. Uh, you're right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just echo what Matt said and I I really don't know what a good solution for it is either. Uh, but what it made me think of was how, uh, even, even within Judeo Christian beliefs, you have a lot of, of, um, pushback and, and strife, like between its individual members. Um, you know, prior to this modern era where you have more, atheists and secular people that are speaking up prior to that you had uh infighting between 
religious groups. And uh, one, one of the things that I was thinking of was, um, of course, it's 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 a movie that that I heard about this from. It was Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know if either Matt or anybody else has has really seen that, but but basically, it's a story about uh, it's it's a real I believe it's World War II story about a uh, soldier who was part of a specific denomination of Christianity that was very pacifist and didn't want to actually like fight. So he became a medic and he actually had to like go through the, the whole legal proceedings of being able to retain that right, you know, because of his religious convictions. And so it, it just seems to me like the whole chaplaincy cha- chaplain thing in, in, in the military would present a number of obstacles for people in the military, regardless of, of branch, because then, you know, you're, you're trying to find, you know, what chaplain is really going to serve your own religious ideals. And with how diverse religious ideals are, it just seems like it would be an impossible task. And I think that, you know, Matt's uh, solution for that being that, you know, you have more secular based, um, counselors or chaplains uh, that could then reach out to somebody that could specifically help an individual uh, given their own religious pro- proclivities. I, I, I feel like that's the best option that you could do without just, you know, totally removing the, the whole idea of a chaplain and just having, you, you know, counselors because in, in war, I feel like that's, kind of what you would need is is counselors to help you deal with the trauma that war places on somebody and um i've i've worked you know alongside soldiers uh in the army um through my job so i mean i i i don't know intimately the toll that it takes but i mean i can um you know r- relate to you know certain certain feelings that these soldiers have um because I've I've been in places where they're literally deployed and they're near active war zones and it's it's rather stressful. Uh, I've been in high stress situations like that before, and I feel like I feel like having a more secular option would probably be best. But I know that's not what everybody wants or is looking for, and so I I don't know if I was answering a question or just giving my thoughts, but that, that's what I have to think about the entire idea of chaplains in the military. Actually, a quick note on, on the movie you mentioned, Hexar Ridge. I, as a combat medic, that movie, I, 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 I watched that movie uh, many times over, and um, it, it is an excellent film depicting the true trauma of war, and, and especially related to my job. However, it, it and at the same time, caused me the same dilemma as we're focusing on someone who utilizes religion and within a so-called secular organization. But putting that aside, um, what I have witnessed uh, with the chaplains in our formation has, has uh, kind of been kind of productive to their mission to where I've become a greater atheist and a little bit more anti-theist than before, watching uh, prayer being involved when we're supposedly fighting the good secular war against another religious, you know, uh, what we would consider um, religious um, fanatics. So, yeah, that's all I have. No, I appreciate your thoughts. It's been helpful. Awesome. Thanks, Jaime. If you come up with a better solution for chaplaincy in the military, uh, I'll back it. Not that my backing of it does anything, but cheers. Thanks. All right. Oh, so now, Darth, you're saying you did say it, but you retracted it and I missed it. Well, that's better than suggesting I'm a fucking liar. There you go. There's something from chat that nobody (laughs) watching this video will understand at all. (laughs) (laughs) See, that's the multitasking. When somebody types something and I reply to it, and then when I'm not paying attention, they're like, oh, that's not what I meant. But it's what you said. I didn't say, I, how am I supposed to know what you fucking meant? I know what you said. And I called you out for what you actually said. There's other stuff in chat too. You guys, if you're not actively watching and, and participating in chat, you can do that. There's great mods there that will uh, monitor and shut stuff down. But, um, you know, I, I might type something in chat on occasion. But we're really appreciative of the people who are participating. Um, but, yeah, if you, if you say something wrong and you get caught, 
then, yep, whoops, sorry, we moved on from that. Uh, but I've got super chats, and it's time for us to start reading them. So, 10 bucks from Kipe122. You said there was a Catholic hospital that wanted two funerals after an abortion. No, one for the fetus and one for the afterbirth. Can you explain where you got this from? It's not after an abortion. A Catholic hospital is not going to do an abortion. It was after a miscarriage. After a miscarriage, there were two funerals, one for the fetus and one for the other birth matter, because it's Catholic doctrine that that, that all of the birth matter counts this way. Uh, I have a friend who's a social worker at a Catholic hospital here in Austin who told me about that. That's where I got it. But not, not after an abortion. You're not going to get an abortion at a Catholic hospital. Or anywhere else if we keep going at the rate we're going. And you want me to read this one? Sure. <laughs> okay. $10 from Monkey at Typewriter says, uh, if you could wave a magic policy wand and fix gun violence in the USA, about 60% of the country would say no. There was also a similar incident at a school in GA today, but it barely made the news. I mean, I'm not surprised that there was a similar incident at a school in Georgia or anywhere in the United States, but I'm also yeah. kind of curious as to if you could wave a magic policy wand, about 60% of the country would still say no to stopping gun violence. I'm not exactly sure yeah, where that's coming that's from. I, I, I think the problem is that, that people, w I think most people would happily say, of course I'd wave a magic wand and fix gun violence but they know it's not possible. And so it's really easy to say you'd do something that you know you'd never. Um, here's what I've done. And people will say, Matt's not telling the truth. Jesus, if he existed, gave up a weekend. There was no sacrifice. Jesus, if he existed, started as God, came down and cosplayed as human, and ended up as God. Jesus, if he existed, had a really fucked up weekend, and then got to be God forever. I would, if you could guarantee me that this would work, I would let you carve me up alive and slaughter me on television broadcast to the world if you could guarantee that it would end hunger in the world. And I would stay dead. I get... What am I going to get out of it? Well, for first of all, I'll be known forever as the guy that ended hunger, that gave up his own life. So I'm not going to pretend like there's not some potential benefit to me. I won't enjoy it, but I would do it. Jesus, if he existed at all, barely gave up part of a weekend and accomplished fuck all. Just convinced a bunch of people to give 10 or 20% of their salary uh, to churches and walk around being nosy little busybodies telling everybody else what to do and trying to legislate their beliefs onto them. Jesus accomplished nothing. The Bible is absolutely start to finish a comedy of errors. Go watch the talk that I gave in Australia where I dressed up in a bathrobe and came out as God wondering why people won't love me. I created them, it goes wrong. I try to fix it, it goes wrong. I try to fix it again, it goes wrong. Instead of trying to get everybody to love me, I just pick my favorite people. Those Jews, they're, you're, you're not my favorite. Fuck everybody else. Matter of fact, let's go slaughter some of them. Let's wipe the Amalekites off the face of the earth so that nobody will even remember them. And then let's write it down so that everybody will remember that we did it. And we'll keep going and going and going and going. And then when it all goes wrong over and over again, I will then come down, instantiate myself in human form by impregnating someone without their consent. Um, and then I will sacrifice myself to myself to serve as a loophole for rules that I'm in charge of, for problems that I created. I will accomplish nothing. Christianity is a chronicle, a comedy, a black comedy of a God's failure to get anybody to actually fucking love him. That's what Christianity is and Judaism. 10 pounds from Oliver Thompson. If a God actually existed, do you think it would have the same problem of hard solipsism as we do? How would it know it doesn't just think it's an all-known, all-powerful deity? Yeah, I don't see any solution to the, for the problem of hard solipsism, even if you're a God. However, I would say that 
a lot of gods are defined with some version of omniscience, some version of having all knowledge. And even the most sensible, reasonable version of that would mean that a god knows everything that can be known. And so if there is a solution to the problem of hard solipsism, an all-knowing god would know that solution if it's knowable. But we don't know if the solution's knowable. It may not be. Yeah, I really think that the only answer to this would be some form of special pleading. Because you'd have to specially plead, well, this god would know that he is the end-all, be-all. Or this god would definitely know, you know, this information if he's all-knowing. I just, I don't know. I feel like that's ultimately just special pleading for your, you know, god in particular. It's wild that people will acknowledge that they have the same limitations that you and I do on what we can know or what we apparently can know currently given the knowledge of humans as a species. And then largely we would all agree on what seems to be perhaps forever beyond our kin. Um, you know, we can argue about whether or not time travel is possible. It's probably not. Um, we can argue about whether or not we can know anything prior to the Planck time. Probably not. But the, the, the path that they go down leads them to start talking about because they think they have a friend who knows everything they can start making proclamations about shit they don't know and shit they cannot know and then just hang it on that well god knows and it's been revealed to me that god knows okay well then why doesn't god reveal to you the answer you know if there's a solution to hard, hard solipsism and god knows it why doesn't god just tell you i mean is that going to be a dramatic uh, negative for the world to solve the problem of hard solipsism? Wouldn't that end a good chunk of the calls that we've got? And wouldn't that end the show? Because God has then solved the thing that humans can't? It's funny to me, and I'm, I, I don't want to give too much away. There may be a video about people purportedly speaking languages they don't know. And if God speaks every language... John, do you speak Swahili at all? No. Cool. So if John came to me and said, hey, God's got a message for you, I would ask for, if John called in the show, I would ask for John to ask God to deliver the message in Swahili. It should be very easy for God to do. And, and it doesn't matter. John doesn't even have to know what the words are. He can just, you know, God can make John's mouth speak Swahili, even though he doesn't understand it. And it would be recorded, and somebody else could say, ah, yes, wow, that's wonderful. That's perfect diction and enunciation and everything else. And what it, what John said, even though he doesn't know it, is this, 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 this. But instead, you get, and, you, and they claim, I'm speaking in the tongues of angels. How the fuck you know that? Pull the other one. 1999 from Greg, Greg Markowski, one of my band uh, mates' wives, uh, or one of my band mates' wife, knew the murder victim today here in Kansas City. I oh, worked no. very close to Union Station, but because of the parade, had the day off. Yeah, I'm so sorry for for your your friend's um, uh, wife's friend. Um, Sorry, I was just I was processing through that. Um, that's got to be incredibly difficult. There, I, I hate that that y'all are having to go through that. Everybody's having to go through that. I, I want to let me let me let you get this next super chat because I want to see if I can do something with my screen um, to kind of punctuate a point. So go ahead and do that one for me. <laughs> Ten dollars from Mario Marufo, who says, "Would the host be willing to discuss Jesus mythicism?" And then oh, a monk with I didn't even see. read that, John. I kid you not. I I, had, I did not read that and throw it at you. Uh, I had no okay. idea what thing was. No, I'm I'm genuinely <laughs> trying to. I, I'm not able to get. So I went. Let me just do this before we answer this. You guys take my word for it. I don't have screen sharing set up easily. But I went to news.google.com because I wanted to find updates 
about the Kansas City shooting, it's no longer on the front page of news.google.com. The top story is our GOP warning of national security threat about Russia wanting nuclear weapons. Mulvaney is absolutely stunned by Turner national security warning. U.S. has new intelligence on Russia and nu nuclear capacities. Russian nuclear capabilities in space could threaten international satellites. Senate looks to quickly reject Mayorkas impeachment charges and speedy trial. GOP Rep Van Dyne discusses divide in House over Ukraine. House votes to impeach DHS Secretary Mayorkas. Mayorkas becomes first cabinet secretary impeached in 18, since 1876. George Santos trolls New York Republicans after Mazi Pillip loses special election. Uh, Fonnie Willis hearing could decide fate of Trump's Georgia election. And then there's the, the local news and the picks for me. The shooting today has already in the span of the two hours and 16 minutes since I started talking about it, dropped off the front page of the news, just like I fucking said it would. So on this question, uh, yeah, I was, not, I was not tossing this to you, from Mario, would we be willing to discuss Jesus' mythicism? Right now, no. <laughs> Some other time, sure. Uh, way too yeah. late in the show well, to do that. Right, yeah. But I do, I do want to say, like, I... I don't have a problem with because I know Matt's not a mythicist, even though uh, I and I mean I am. I don't have a problem with people that disagree with me. Uh, you know, I know Matt disagrees with me, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, there, like uh, almost none of my friends in the atheist space agree with me on the topic, and I mean that's just. I mean, we all have different opinions about these things, and I think that it's fine. I think it's fine yeah. that Matt, you know, isn't a mythicist, and uh, you know, I, I would hope that Matt would think that you know he doesn't really care about whether or not i'm a mythicist it, i mean i wouldn't think that it would affect you all that much there matt nope whether, whether or not somebody's a mythicist i mean and i have a number of friends who are and i've done so fitz david fitzgerald has done this show a couple of times but also uh, on my personal atheist debates thing we've sat down and talked about myths and argued about it i love david i i don't i can disagree with somebody and argue vehemently and not have any ill thoughts to them all i'm also friends with richard carrier um or at least friendly acquaintances i, I rick and i haven't talked in a while but I, I got no issue um well all right that's not completely true there are issues nothing this this is not a big deal um but i i would pro i'm not necessarily the best person to dig in on the subject but i'm sure we could talk about it someday just not 10 minutes before we end the show on a Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 999 from Fat Jesus. By the way, the Super Bowl commercial is about Jesus. I didn't talk about that. Uh, and um, they're emphasizing the U.S. at the end of Jesus, that he gets us, and it's about us, and Jesus did this for us, and it's all us. And I think that I'm trying to encourage people to run with that, but change it to the last three letters, because G is sus and that's that's <laughs> but hi all i love the shows on the line and all you crazy characters matt are you and john going to debate jesus existence i definitely watch i'll be watching tomorrow john can apply for end boss if he wants to yeah <laughs> i i feel like i have a direct line to get on end boss <laughs> yeah. john, john can talk to me about mythicism whenever he wants but yeah probably not today all right, all right so we get more. 10 yeah, 10 from the Raven 200. I'm totally in favor of legalization and regulation of sex work. I'd never start an OnlyFans, though. I would never subject anyone to that. Jimmy, go get locked in a coquina clutch by Samoa Joe. Oh, wow. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. I don't either, because I don't know Samoa Joe's moves. Uh, oddly oh. enough, it, there's <laughs> lots of things that, that, that slip through the cracks of my memory now. Uh, I was actually pointing out, you know, uh, the things that Biden purportedly forgot. And I'm like, I got up twice yesterday, once after I was high, but once before I was high, to go in and take my weekly shot of uh, Ozempic for my diabetes, got up, walked in, got in the kitchen, forgot what I was there for, went back down, sat down, then got high, and then remembered what it was walked back in and forgot again. Now, I'm 54. I have a pretty decent memory, but it's nothing for people to forget things. 
And it's curious. I, I loved the clips that were running around after people were giving Biden shit, um, showing Trump and all of his kids failing to recollect anything under oath. I, I just don't recall. Yeah. I don't recall ever meeting that person. I don't recall that. I don't recall that. Cool. Well, I think one of the big problems with Trump and, and probably his kin, but uh, is that they they regularly state things like with such confidence like the one thing that i'm thinking of right now is uh i think it was back in maybe 2020 or 2021 but trump congratulated the kansas city chiefs and said that they made their state of kansas proud yes and it's like that's not where kansas city is there bud although but, just well kansas city is in kansas and in missouri, missouri but the chiefs are on the missouri side because um, that's right. a good side. That's the side I was born on. You can't see Kansas folks. They're not even real people. They're they're Kansans. Uh, but to be fair, <laughs> Biden just confused um, the leader of Egypt with the leader of Mexico the other day. Hey, my memory is good enough to remember what Biden got wrong the other day, even if I do forget what medication I'm going into the kitchen for. It's it's not surprising to me that somebody's going to have a lapse of memory. Are there other people that I would prefer for for president? Sure. I actually hope. Um, that no matter what happens this year, um, I'm leaning very strongly towards supporting Gavin Newsom in the coming years because I'm absolutely convinced that he's going to run. And I agree with him on more issues than almost anybody else who's likely to run except for Elizabeth Warren. And I don't think she's going to run again. Uh, but if she does, it'll be a tough call for me as to who, who gets my vote. After, we'll have to a, a, ask him questions after and listen. News yeah, after Newsom uh, took on uh, DeSantis, I mean, I was yeah. like, yeah, I mean, if he if Newsom ran, I would I would probably end up voting for him, to be honest. Um, he seems, but from what I've seen, he's a good guy. I don't think he's been fully vetted, but yeah, you know, he's running California. I mean, California's fucking huge. <laughs> All right, ten, another ten dollars from the Raven two hundred. Have God deliver the important message in Nimi Potimi, Nimi. Putin key. Nesper's language. I don't know. Then translated into French, then English, then back to Nesper's. <laughs> this message to be Frankenstein. Uh, we're, we're trying to <laughs> avoid uh, the, um, the telephone game here. Um, we, we don't want God to go through too many hoops. But if God does it, yes. If God does the translation in English in John's head, well, then how do I know John isn't just making shit up? I want, I want John to speak a language that he doesn't know anything about. How cool would that be? Why is it? Oh, you hear that all the time. These, you hear that from the people who are advocating for um, these people with past lives. Oh, there's so many studies and these people with the past lives, they speak languages that they've never learned. How do you know that? How do you know that they're well, speaking a language that they never learned? Yeah, it's also popular in like the demonic possession sort of area. Like people that are talking about either being demonically possessed or uh exorcisms uh you know they they claim oh well this person spoke in latin and they've never even heard of latin it's like i'm sure uh definitely they've never heard of latin <laughs> all right and what was supposed to be the final super chat of today but i'm gonna bet that somebody listening is just gonna get one more in after i'm done oh there it is already um $20 from Godfrey and good. If Trump gives himself immunity, should the court still prosecute him to put his crimes on record? I, I honestly don't know what the process is, um, but I don't, I'm not convinced he can give himself immunity. There are non-federal crimes he's being charged with, so he can't pardon himself. The courts have already ruled that he doesn't have immunity. And so um, absolutely, since he doesn't have immunity, unless that changes, um, they should prosecute him even, even if he's never penalized for it. And here's the, yeah, the, well, the actual final one. Okay. $20 from Godfrey and good saying also, I won't say go fuck yourself, Jimmy. I'll just say that Jimmy is in my top eight favorite. The line producers. <laughs> wow. I had to go out to eight when there's only like three. Yeah. <laughs> there's some repeats. In there. We're going to add on that last one, John. So go ahead. And by the way, take the we're going to wrap up here in just a second anyway so get in whatever you're going to say and then also let people know where to follow you and see your stuff and talk with you and all that oh promote oh, yourself yeah, damn it 
if you if you like arguing about whether or not Jesus existed, which is the most paramount thing to ever discuss ever, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, so uh, over on my channel on Godless Engineer, you can uh, find like responses to videos. Like I recently did a response to this uh, YouTube, conservative YouTuber named Gothics, uh, where we talked about a number of like political issues and stuff. But we also talk about like uh, recently this week um, I reviewed a video that was about uh this guy trying to shame uh men specifically uh for being too weak and how atheism is rooted in men being weak or in some kind of sense like that so we talk about a variety of things over there on my channel um and we do uh bible studies sometimes like we we have a pretty good time over there uh we have weekly live shows too if you like uh watching live content uh you know like here on the line um and so, yeah, uh, I got a lot of great stuff going on. You can just go to youtube.com godless engineer or just search up godless engineer. We've also got a lot of great stuff going out on our Facebook uh, page, godless engineering. So you can go and check us out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for me. I forgot what I was actually going to chime in with before that last, uh, before that last super chat. So I'm sure it wasn't all that important. <laughs> I have, I have a merch idea for you. Okay. Okay. You just get an engine, which is already godless, and you make mm -hmm. a dangly earring out of it, and you have a godless engine earring. <laughs> that's that's that, that that's interesting. I feel like that's a very niche group there, but I think that there probably will be somebody that would love to buy those. <laughs> <laughs> my ears are pierced even though i almost never wear earrings again but if you had it i, I i'd get one and and i wear it the next time you're on oh shit i was supposed to wear a t-shirt i'm gonna have to wear that on sunday um so i don't normally wear the t-shirts on the show i normally you know, i've just gotten the habit of always wearing something kind of with a collar and maybe with a pocket although that comes from uh my years doing magic stuff i don't i don't like to not have a pocket right here because it's it's just too handy for too many things that I would normally be doing. Uh, but yes, I need to wear Forrest's t-shirt. We've got Forrest shirts. We've got uh, mugs, all that stuff. Here's the thing. Yes, if I go to googlenews.com or, or news.google.com right now, the Kansas City shooting is no longer on the front page. I don't expect we'll hear much about it other than the funeral, and it'll get referenced in a... Um, in a video, in a couple news clips about how many mass shootings there were, and we will continue to ignore it and do nothing and feel nothing and uh, get nothing right. Oops. Um, Amargan said he hates me. I don't know how I'm going to live. That's just not fair. Right at the end of the show, for you to say you hate me like that. No. Uh, yes, and I'm going to guess that it's probably because of my very bad puns and stuff like that. It's only fair. So here's what we need to do. As I mentioned the last time I did a show here last Sunday, try and find the joy. Try and find the things that make you able to not tune out. Find the time for you that gives you the gumption to pay attention to the news to care about what's happening, to hit the phone banks, to write and call your representatives, to be willing to get into conversations when you hear things that are clearly wrong and clearly false. All of that is important. And it's probably the only thing I can think of where we're gonna have some reasonable chance at pushing back on the things that we, all of us, for whatever reason, have failed to do. And you can be, well, I've voted the right way every single time. And I've been, you know, advocating again for the elimination of guns and mass shootings and, and everything all the time. Great. Congrats. Seriously, that wasn't a golf clap. Keep doing that thing and convince more people too. Because what I see happening, absolutely is a huge chunk of the population giving up, tuning out. Oh, 
We elected Trump. We had four years of that. Now it just doesn't stop. He's probably going to come in again. Nobody cares about the truth. We're in a post-truth world. They're just spreading lies. They're doing rallies. It's just not true. Oh, the election was stolen. Stop the steal. There's a conspiracy with Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey for the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl to endorse Biden. I missed that endorsement. Um, oh, now I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. The algorithms have you. They own you. And it's not going to get better. And you can't drop out of all of the things that allow the algorithms to own you because then you won't know what the hell's going on and you won't have any method to interact with anybody else working towards any sort of solution. So find the things that bring you joy. In my case, it's all the reptiles and things that we have. It's going to hot pot with Arden after the shows. Um, it's uh, visiting with my brother and his family. It's doing the things that make me, remind me that not everything is a cesspool. Not everything is awful. And the rest of it, I just kind of have confidence that I'm not going to be able to fix everything and neither is anybody else, but maybe, maybe we can get enough people together to fix something. Maybe it'll be mass shootings. Maybe it'll be climate change. Maybe it'll be reproductive rights. Maybe it'll be respecting mental health issues instead of deciding that, oh, I think this is a mental health issue, so I'm going to treat them like shit. Because, yeah, that fucking helps. One of my favorite jokes ever from James Acaster talking about comedians dumping on trans people. And he's like, uh, I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. You know, I'm into he's like, yeah, because that's exactly what trans people haven't had enough of is harassment, essentially. Um, uh, it's it's so, so good of you to be the edgy comedian and bully trans folks because they definitely haven't had enough of that. Watching this stuff happen is one thing. Participating in it week after week after week, having a parade of emails and attacks, it's exhausting. I won't quit. And I'm hoping that enough of you don't quit either because I honestly am still cautiously optimistic that we might, might survive and see a decent future. That these moments where everything feels like it's, it's just completely non-functional, dysfunctional, broken, that maybe those moments will be on the decline after we make some changes. Don't forget to tune in to Transatlantic call and Show tomorrow with Katie and Arden. And Katie will be back actually on the Sunday show with me as well next Monday. Skep Talks, Shannon Q and Maya Atkinson. And I'll be back next week with the hangup. In the meantime, roll the music. That's the music. Hey, look, there's patrons. Huge thank you to all of our mods and Phoebe for screening today. Great. Matthew and Brisbane, we love you so much. I can't wait for you to call and get back again. Patreon.com slash call the lion. Check out 